If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. I'm convinced I'm going to run a little meat diet for a minute. I knew it. Well, well, I knew it with the whole testosterone. And, oh, just so between here's the, the testosterone thing and the psoriasis thing too. I've just I've never thought to 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 run that and see. I mean, I'm so I tried. I've it done for, vegan stuff. I've I done, tried it for two days. I didn't feel good. That's um, not enough time. I, well, that's true, but I felt I didn't feel good at all, and I have to listen to my body. And did you? Yeah. And did you? I've uh, always felt. Did good, you just no veggies? Me. None at all. Okay. So here's the thing. I. Um, he also did it after he was, fast. He, he, did, he was, this is a very compelling episode you're about to listen to. So mm-hmm. Dr. Sean Baker, he's the carnivore diet guy. This guy only has eaten meat, only. No plant product at 14 all. 14 months. For, Sounds crazy. For 14 months, but he makes a very compelling argument. He's not- um, Not dogmatic. He's not dogmatic about it. You no. know, at the end of the day, the message he's saying is listening to, listen to your body, yeah. which is, I love because he's a doctor. Yeah. He's a surgeon. And he's saying things like, you know- you know, blood values, there's some merit. However, what's most important is how much energy you have, your skin. Right. Do you have pain? You know, what's your digestion how's like? How does that translate to how's what your, your body's libido? telling you? Yeah, how's your libido? How's your how's your sleep? And it's like, man, that's what we talk about. Can all we the time. talk about how different he looks in person compared to Instagram and all oh, the videos? He's, which... he's a big yeah. fucker. He's, he's a monster. A monster. <laughs> yeah, he's a big dude. Man. Not a lot of guys he make crush me feel you. like a little baby. Like he's uh, like he's up there with like that massive. I mean, he's, he's what just towers. He's lean as fuck right now at two forty five. He's mm-hmm. like he's fifty something years 52. old. Right? Fifty two. He's okay. fifty two. Deadlifts like what seven hundred pounds? That was his most seven seventy. Bro, all natural. natural. All natural. Yeah. Uh, he's a world record holder in uh, rowing, right? Yeah. And he rowing. also was a professional rugby player too. So I mean, he's, he's got he's got yeah. quite the the past as far as like athletics is concerned. So yeah, on genetic propensity, like he's definitely up there. But at the same time, what he was saying was very compelling. It's a it's a great conversation. I mean, I was throwing a few curveballs at him to see how he'd respond, but. He knows his shit. He's We got in a lot of good topics too, man. We got into the medical industry too and the mm-hmm. bullshit behind that. We got mm-hmm. into blue zones. He touched that he had some really interesting facts talking about yep. the blue zones. The only zones. thing I was upset is that he's holding out on his blood, blood for Rob, our, our friend Rob. Yeah, Wolf. so he's going to re- be revealing That's that okay. there. Yeah. Um, but he did tell us off air. Um, maybe we should just say it here. We should. <laughs> Let's hijack no, it. We, we, we told him we nah, wouldn't. Nah, so. nah, nah. Uh, but a, a compelling, compelling episode. So... Uh, it's very interesting. I think it's a bit extreme. Definitely don't recommend this uh, for most people. But at the end of the day, the best judge, the best coach, the best anything that you'll ever have is your body. Yeah. And that's really what he says in this episode. So without any further ado, we're talking to Dr. Did you Sean say Baker. You could, did you say we could find Sean? I'm going to tell him right now. So on Instagram, it's at Sean Baker. That's S H A W N. B A K E R 1967. That's his Instagram page. Uh, his Twitter page is S Baker M D. His Facebook page is World Carnivore Tribe. His websites are meatheels.com. I love that one. Or carnivore training systems.com. Also, don't forget uh, mindpumpmedia.com. This is where you can go to find out more about our maps. Programs. These are training systems or programs designed. It's something that Sean talks about in this episode. He talks about the. Uh, we talk about how the medical system, uh, the prescription is thirty minutes of vigorous activity every day. But they don't talk about resistance training, right? And he agreed with us as far as the importance of that. And this, I mean, that's really the our foundational program is Maps Anabolic, which I would say is the, is the perfect program for somebody looking for overall health. Absolutely. And if you get a bundle, a bundle combines several Maps programs, so you have longer than just you know 12 weeks you have a longer period of time for example our super bundle which is like the that's the ultimate bundle that we offer it's a year's worth of exercise program so in other words if you enrolled in it and then started tomorrow you would have your entire year planned out for you every week every couple weeks the workout changes every few months the whole goal changes um, all the programs come with video demos exercise blueprints it's very thorough it's the best programs we think you can find online. And of course, they're expertly programmed by ourselves. So if you want to learn more or if you just want to get started, go to mindpumpmedia.com. Here we are talking to Dr. Sean Baker. I'm in the bathroom, right? And I'm, I'm uh, doing my morning, uh, my morning, morning, my morning shit. And yeah. uh, I walk out 
and uh, Dr. Sean Baker's outside talking to Adam and, and Justin. And you're a massive person. You're a much bigger yeah, than yeah, I thought yeah. you were. He, he threw us all off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instagram like a, does not do you justice, my you're just, friend. Yeah. You're like a, you're just a big <laughs> it's like dude. a redwood tree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, sorry to disappoint you guys or surprise you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, how, what are you, sports, you're, you're an athlete, right? Yeah, I've been an athlete my whole life, did a whole bunch of different sports. Highly uh, competitive rower. Uh, right now, right now, that's what I'm done playing on that concept too, breaking some world records on that stuff. But oh uh, shit, no big deal. How does that work? <laughs> no big How does deal. that work to com- to to like you said on a concept two? Yeah, that? so concept two has been maintaining world records and, and national records for about 35 years or so. And mm-hmm. so they're, they're basically, when you do a, you know a, a legitimate verified distance. It has a computer code that it spits out, and they collect that you know around the world. And oh, just I didn't even your know that. So there's usually, I mean, they just had the World Indoor Rowing Championships, and usually there's about three thousand people to go to that for the two thousand meter distance. But there's probably several hundred thousand people every year that submit their time. Now, is so, it an age category, or is it? Yeah, there's, there's both. There's age categories, and so I, I, I broke the world records for the five hundred meter row, the one minute row, and the hundred meter row for the over fifty group uh, this year. And then last year, I broke some of the 40-plus records as a 49-year-old. Um, how, how fast did you pull the 500 meters? Uh, 114. Yeah, that's quick. Yeah, I, so. I, don't, I don't know what reference that is, but that's yeah. obviously yeah. fast if yeah. it's a world record. Yeah, that's cool. You, not only that, you also did strongman, and you mentioned, too, like with Matt Vincent, you did some Highland Games as well, huh? Yeah, in my 40s, I took up uh, the Highland Games and started throwing. I was kind of funny. I was working in my clinic, and... My physician's assistant comes in at kilt, and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's talking awesome. about the Highland Games, and I said, well, that looks kind of fun. So I went out there and just went out and did it one time. You know, it's throwing a bunch of crap. You know, you throw cabers and uh, shot put stones and throw hammers and throw these these weights, and I did it, and I was you know, pretty decent at it. And so I, I, I kind of said, this sounds fun, so I'll train for it. So I think within two years, I ended up winning the Masters World Championships at that. And so I just uh, you know went up to Denver one year. It was, it was held in Denver, and I competed about – Five or six years, I, I either won the world championships or took second or third a bunch of times. So, but they're, they're, those are some big dudes, man. Those are guys are like, I when I because right now I'm down about two forty five, but back then I was about two eighty five, and uh, I was a little guy. You know, these guys are like six nine, three forty, just, just, just beast, and you have to be because. Like when you throw in that 56 pound weight, you know, Matt will tell you, if you don't have enough strength or size to counter that, it'll just knock you on your ass. And I mean, I've seen guys, 300 pound guys, just get knocked over trying to throw that thing. It's, <laughs> oh, it's, wow. It's, 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 it's <laughs> you, you train naturally or are you, are you a natural athlete? Yeah, I've, been, you... I've never taken drugs, never taken steroids. I don't take hormones. I've done that my whole life. When I competed as a power lifter, I got up to a, a 350 kilo, 772 pound deadlift as a, as a drug free athlete. Damn. Wait, 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 natural? Yeah, Absolutely, yeah, that's natural. insane. Yeah, told me yeah that. I mean, I was, crazy. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I train hard. I know what I'm doing, but I mean, I, you know, I just obviously got a pretty good work ethic on that stuff, and so I put that stuff together. So before we talk about the elephant in the room, which is this this diet that you've been talking about on, on other podcasts, I heard uh, you, Justin, actually was the one that brought you to our attention. He's like, you got to listen to this uh, episode. It was the one with, uh, with Joe Rogan where you were talking about your diet. But well, that was a great I, I, conversation. I, I want to get into that before I do. Like you have a medical background and I know your background is not in nutrition, uh, but I think your background does show that you are a, a capable, intelligent human being. What do you, what do you, what do you do for a living? What's your training? Well, in? I mean, my training, I was an orthopedic surgeon. So, you know, went to medical school, did my, did my, you know, had a biology degree. I uh, went to medical school, uh, you know, did my surgical training, you know, went in, went into the military, took, did a bunch of trauma surgery and, uh, but, you know, nutrition plays a role in medicine for sure. You know, it's not that we're nutritionists, but we certainly understand how the body works. We understand how things impact physiology pretty well. Very, very, uh, know a lot about physiology. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's part of your, your training. You know, that was one of my, in fact, in medical school, physiology was one of my favorite subjects, even though I ended up being a surgeon. Uh, but, uh, and then through, you know, about half a decade of self-exploration, I mean, I've been reading, you know, the nutrition literature for years now, and I've been self-experimenting and, you know, again, any intelligent person, you don't have to have a particular title or degree can figure this stuff out. You just got to have a brain mm-hmm. and access to the to the material. Well, I mean, you're looking at three of them right here. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> just there you go, it guys. Out. Yeah, you figure yeah. it out, man. You make it work. You know, can you, you t- it works. Yeah, can you talk about, like, uh, that process of, of starting the diet? Like, you went through a, a bunch of different diets and kind of found your way to this uh, carnivore diet. Yeah, I mean, I've been training, like I said, I've been training my ass off, you know, my whole life. You know, my philosophy up until I was about my early 40s was I'll eat whatever I damn want, but as long as I train hard, you know, then I'll be fine. And then that same thing here. Yeah. And yeah. then that works until it stops working. And then you, you know, <laughs> at some point you're like, wait a minute, I'm getting fat. You know, my blood pressure's going up. I'm not sleeping well. I've got, 
you know, probably, I'm probably, you know, metabolic syndrome. All those things start happening to me in my mid 40s. And I was like, F that, I'm not going to do that. So I started really focusing on nutrition. I went through the low fat, you know, almost the vegetarian phase where I was eating, you know, the, the you know, lean meats and just a bunch of vegetables. And, uh, and and that worked. I mean, I lost weight. I got leaner, but I was pretty damn miserable on that on that particular. How diet. so? Uh, I just was. I was kind of grumpy all the time. I was hungry all the time. I was training three times a day. I mean, I was getting up in the morning, knocking out a couple thousand jump ropes. You know, going to work, going to clinic, run home at lunch, train. You know, lift some weights, come back home at night, do another couple thousand jump ropes. And I I lost. I went from two eighty five to about two thirty in about three months. I mean, I just knocked it off real quick. Wow. And, and I mean, I was lean. Uh, you know, but I was just like, this is not sustainable for me. I mean, I, I couldn't live that way. And then I got into the paleo diet. You know, that was, that was, you know, probably about six years, five, six years ago. And so then I started, well, this sounds more reasonable. And I, and I you know, you got to eat more animal protein and, and it, it just felt better. Then as I just kind of continued reading about, you know, ketogenic diets, low carb diets, I started playing with that stuff. Uh, did now, that were, you, years. were you changing the diets? Uh, obviously you went from the more vegan diet to the paleo one because you just felt like shit. When you went from paleo to keto, was it also because you weren't feeling good, or were you just more curious? I was more I was more curious than anything else, and I thought the science seemed to make sense to me. You know, and I just like I want to you know I want to put this in the context of athletic performance and health. And and what I was seeing, just reading some of the stories as a surgeon, I was seeing a lot of people getting better from a health standpoint, not just weight loss, because you know people only focus on how much weight I'm going to lose, what I look like. Mm-hmm. As a physician, you're like, wait a minute, this is can potentially helps people from you know from having chronic disease issues, and so. I started looking at that, and I noticed for myself on a ketogenic diet, I got some things that were, uh, you know, troubling me, you know, joint pain, some of that stuff, and that started to get a little better, and I started to apply it to patients. I started seeing pretty good progress with the patients, and then I just kind of continued to read more, and then I started seeing about these crazy people eating all meat, you know, and I was like, well, this sounds kind of interesting. I know there were some historical references that show that, you know, some of the earlier bodybuilders kind of gravitated toward that stuff, and then certainly, you know, you look at some of these historical populations like the Mongols and what they ate and how robust the people they were. Some of the Inuit we know were very, they had really high work capacities. You know, they, we often talk about their diet, but we also, if you look at their physical performance, Plains Indians, these, these people were known to be just physically robust, you know, uh, people that really did well. And I said, well, I'll, I'll try it for a month. And I did, and I felt really good. And uh, I, I get, you know, at the end of the month, I said, okay, I did it for a month. I didn't die. I didn't get scurvy. You know, nothing bad happened to me. So I said, well, that was neat. And I went back to my ketogenic diet, and I just didn't feel as good. I mean, I literally, I was just like, my, you know, my gastrointestinal system doesn't feel good. My energy's not as good. My, my, some of my joints started kind of bugging me a little bit. So I said, well, I'd rather feel good and perform good. And, and that's what kind of drove me. So then I just continued doing it. And now I've been doing it for uh, basically 14 months straight without, I haven't, had, I haven't had a vegetable or a piece of fruit or any significant carbohydrate in 14 months. And, so, so to be clear, carnivore diet is literally no plant, yeah. anything. So like no coconut oil, no, no nuts, <laughs> like no, none yeah, of that yeah. stuff. I mean, it's, all... it's, it's basically I eat a, you know, a pound or two of steak in the morning and a pound or two of steak at night typically. I might have some eggs occasionally. I rarely have a little dairy. When I started out, I had a little more variety. You know, I would, I would eat uh, eggs and bacon and, and you, know, you know, hamburgers and meat with cheese and steaks and a little bit of seafood. Uh, and then as I got farther into it, I just, I just kind of, it's kind of weird. It seems so weird and restrictive, but as I got into it, I found that I, I crave steak more. I felt better when I just ate steak. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's, you know, generally what I do. I mean, sometimes I'll have a little bit of variety if I'm cooking for somebody else, you know, somebody else wants like, you know, a lot of times the family wants some seafood, I'll cook some shrimp up and I'll eat that with my diet. But if it's just me by myself, uh, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, I'll just go get a steak and. I'll be fine. You know? Now, being a being a a doctor and being trained in Western, you know, uh, basically with Western science, besides the population observations or studies that we have on people like the Inuits, the the literature, or at least what's purported by the literature, or what's you know pushed by the FDA, and is complete opposite. In fact, if I'm sure your peers th- think you're crazy, if you tell your doctor yeah. peers what you're doing. What do they What do they say to you? Yeah, I mean, the majority of them, you know, sort of, you know, with my peers, because, you know, like I said, I'm a big, giant, crazy guy. <laughs> they usually leave me alone. And give me <laughs> they probably, they know. probably ain't seen shit like, what, you. Whatever you want to go ahead and do, you know, it's interesting. No, but I mean, you know, when you look at it, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, on, on the surface, it seems like, you know, we think that, you know, we still have this mindset that, you know, eating red meat, eating saturated fat is going to increase our cholesterol, and cholesterol is the root of all evil. 
But I think as we, we see how this sort of science is developing, we're seeing that probably the, the, sor the underlying source of most disease is underlying inflammation and possibly hyperinsulinemia. And I think those things are tending to drive that. And, you know, what I'm seeing is how this diet affects those things is, is in a significantly positive way. And we see, you know, time and time again, uh, people that do this, you know, their blood pressure normalizes, their insulin status gets better, their, their, their uh, inflammation status gets better. You know, all these signs of disease, you know, they, they tend to get leaner. You know, you know, there's all these things that, you know, how do I predict if I'm going to be sick or, or if I'm going to be healthy? Well, there's some, some very consistent things that are out there. If you're inflamed, there's, you know, there's very little research that'll, that'll, that will that will counter the fact that inflammation drives disease. Any, any study you look at for any disease, underlying inflammation is always the bad guy. The same thing with hyperinsulinemia, the same thing with things like body composition. So if those things are going in a good direction, and then, and then, I, then again, I look at this, you know, you know, I know Rob Wolf talks about this as well, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on Rob's show in a couple of weeks talking Love. about my lab. Good friend of ours, by the way. But, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, if you look at what are the markers of disease, you know, that you can measure and you care about, how do I feel? How do my joints feel? How do I perform? What's my body composition like? What's my mood like? What's my skin like? What's my libido like? You know, what's my digestion like? And if all of those things get better, right? Every one of those things get better. In my view, you're healthier. Now you may get a lab value that says, well, yeah, but your LDL cholesterol went up. It doesn't seem to make sense from a, just a common sense stand of view that everything gets better, but one lab value is an outlier. Maybe that lab value is not as valuable as we think it is. And there's pretty good evidence that shows that those things don't match up. But many physicians are still just, they don't think about this stuff. They don't have time to think about mm -hmm. this stuff. They're, they're busy running patients through like, a, like an assembly line with 10 minutes to see their patients, you know, look at their labs, check, a, check, a, uh, uh, check off what drug they need to do, and then doing their typing on their electronic medical records to keep the, to keep the ball rolling. I mean, it's, it's not that anybody's given any sort of insightful thought to this stuff for most people in practice. Certainly as a practicing orthopedic surgeon, when I was doing this, I have no incentive to talk about diet. It's all about how many patients can I push through my clinics? How many procedures can I do? How much money can I make for the hospital? And that's what you're incentivized for. And it's unfortunately, it's totally backwards. We have a, a huge emphasis on the back end of disease. You know, we wait till people get sick and then we have this high tech, oh, we have these great tools. We can replace your knee. We can, we can give you a heart transplant. You know, we've got all these, these tools and drugs and the, the emphasis is in the wrong spot. I mean, we gotta go backwards. You know, we can't afford this. We've got this, obviously, this diabetes epidemic that's already here. In 10 years from now, that's going to turn into a dementia epidemic because the underlying disease process is the same thing. So all these overweight diabetics we see now in their 30s and 40s, 10, 15 years from now, they're going to get early dementia. Early dementia is incredibly expensive. You know, there's estimated, you know, and these are probably older dollars, but it takes like something like $50,000 a year to care for somebody with dementia. It's probably more now. It's probably more now. Yeah. And so can you imagine if you're a 30 year old dude and your dad who's in his mid fifties, early sixties gets demented, what do you do? I mean, who's going to pay for that stuff? Cause insurance is not going to pay for it. So you're out $50,000 every year. You might have to quit your job. You know, they have to move in with you. Uh, you know, so this is stuff that's, 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 that's coming home pretty quickly. Some scientists call uh, Alzheimer's and dementia type 3 diabetes, in fact. Yeah, uh, you don't sound like a Western medicine doctor. And this is what I mean by that. And I don't mean that in a, in a, as an insult, by the way. Uh, I, I mean that in a, as a positive because you said something very interesting. And I will, I am going to get into the carnivore diet and why I, why I think you may be actually feeling great on it and why I think it may not, it's probably not a good idea for everybody. But, you know, there's a few things you said that, doctors typically don't say. You said, hey, look, if your joints feel good, you got low inflammation, you got good energy, good skin, good digestion, and you went down a list of things that if they feel good and they're improving, you're probably healthy. Most Western medicine doctors will look at your labs and that's all they push. They really don't ask you how you feel and uh, many of them don't. I don't even know if they don't care necessarily. And this is not a personal, per, you know, personality flaw or personal flaw. It's just they don't push those things. It's all about the labs. Well, you said earlier they're not incentivized for that. You know, that's I'm and I'm curious. Can you go deeper into that? I've always wondered exactly how doctors are incentivized when it comes to drugs and everything like that. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the, on especially obviously, but there are certain like metrics you have to admit. You know, like if you've got a diabetic, you know, you want to get their hemoglobin A1C under a certain level. You know, uh, so they they look at these just these sort of. Uh, you know, markers for disease that aren't necessarily, don't necessarily always represent disease. So they're, they say like, if you have a diabetic with A1C, you know, he will, you, you might want to have to put them on this drug. So they're incentivized to use certain drugs uh, to, to take care of the problem when, you know, 
we know from experience that if you can get their 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 uh, uh, insulin status better through diet, they're going to do a lot better off. But the easier way to do it maybe is put them on a drug. And so some of the incentives don't don't necessarily match up with uh, you know really taking care of an underlying you know uh, sort of root cause of the problem. It's more just make the symptoms go away, make the symptoms seem better. And it doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't do anything to address why these people are sick. You know, it's like, here's the, here's the thing. If you go to the doctor and you've got, uh, you know, and he prescribes you an anti-inflammatory, you know, say you've got, a, you know, I hurt my shoulder or my shoulder's hurting me. And I do this all the time. You know, here's some, here's some, here's some Celebrex, you know, here's some Motrin. The more important question should be, well, why am I inflamed in the first place? Right. Not you're inflamed, here's a drug. Why are you inflamed? If we thought about it, you know, and, and I, I found this to be completely true now that I've kind of stepped away from this stuff and looked at it from a bigger picture. Diet has a huge impact on inflammation. And so a lot of these people that came out of my clinic with shoulder pain, knee pain, uh, and I'm seeing this all the time now as I, as I sort of advocate this stuff, that stuff goes away when you fix the diet, when you remove certain irritants out of their diet. Uh, but instead, the answer is, well, here, here's a Motrin. You know, and this is this is what you know. This is the most expeditious way to take care of the patient. The patient's happy. Oh, I got a drug. I went to the doctor. I got a drug. That is their expectation. Physicians are sort of pharmaceutical facilitators, and that's what we, we you know, we, we largely become technicians because it's such an industry now. It's become the biggest, one of the biggest industries in the country mm -hmm. is healthcare, and there's a lot of dollars in it. It's become a business. You know, we 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 don't. You know, physicians by and large part want to do the right thing. They care about their patients, but the system is set up you know, in a fashion that it doesn't really serve the patients in their best interest. God, how challenging that has to be to be being a doctor. Like. Especially an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, the orthopods I've worked with, and I, I've trained a lot of doctors and surgeons, and, you know, or, when you're an orthopod, you have a you have a tool, and that tool is let's pretend is a hammer. Well, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So every time somebody would go to them and say, I have knee pain, hip pain, whatever, they'd be like, cool, let's look at it. Okay, I think I can do a surgery that'll fix this rather than, Correctional exercise, changing lifestyle, but I, you know, I think there's another side to it too, and that's the, you know, patients' adherence to advice. And you, you tell someone to take a pill versus change your diet, which one are they more likely to do? Are you losing business because of the way you're, you know, because of your? In other words, as an orthopod, when you get someone t coming to you with pain, are you telling them to go fix your diet before I come, well, before I, I work mean, on you? Yeah, this is something that I that I started to do. This is kind of interesting because I'm I'm not I'm not working at the hospital anymore because mm -hmm. me and the hospital got in a big fight over this stuff. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really? Just, Let's yeah, talk about that. I started, yeah. you know, I started to uh, you know start to say, hey, I want a day a week where I can just counsel patients on a lifestyle. And they said, no, there's no appetite. For You're that. kidding me. They said no. Yeah, the, the administrator said, no, we don't want to do that. So I started doing it anyway. I was just like, so, right. so I started, you know, I, I had all this literature. I was handing out all these videos I wanted people to watch, you know, and this is back more ketogenic stuff. And I was getting good, you know, some good results. But at the same time, the hospital continued to, to pressure me not to do that. Um, and then eventually they went after me with something called peer review and then they, they started pulling records and the hospital had a long legal battle that lasted about two years. I finally left the hospital and so I'm not practicing actually right now. So I'm doing some of this other stuff. I may get back into that stuff part time, maybe in a different capacity, but, uh, I mean, there's a, you know, hospitals, you know, they, they run on a fairly tight margin, you know, mm -hmm. they, 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 they may be two, 3%, uh, profit margin and they depend heavily, heavily on surgical volume for that, particularly orthopedic surgeons, because orthopedic surgeons operate. I was doing, you know, 600, 600 surgeries a year. I mean, I was I was a busy, busy Holy surgeon. Because those yeah, are usually making them a lot of money. Yeah, they're routine yeah, surgeries. Yeah, was, you show up, yeah, schedule, yeah, and do yeah. them. I mean, I was, you know, at very, you know, good outcomes. Patients were doing well. But, um, you know, when I started to, to, and I was ahead of the group, I was a head surgeon. And, you know, I was well-liked. And, um, you know, it was, it was just something, but because I didn't want to match up with their values anymore, they they, they they use my competitors to go after me. You know, it was kind of it was just it was just kind of a messed up deal. Uh, there's a lot of politics. I've yeah, trained a lot of doctors. Yeah, no, there's a lot I've of heard. Of, yeah, there's politics in that stuff. I was I was taking our group was taking tens of millions of dollars away from this other group. They didn't like that. Anyways, a long story short, I'm not I'm not actually practicing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully, you know, over the next year or so, is is this sort of alternate life is evolving for me. You know, as I'm kind of impacting, I'm literally. Just sitting there on Twitter and Instagram, I'm changing more lives for the better. Just changing people's diet and having them having them sort of reevaluate their health that way than I did as two decades operating on people, which well, to me is is shocking that I can that you can do crazy, it that way. Right? Well, yeah. so far I really like a, a lot of what you're saying. I really do. I like your attitude and, and your approach to um, you know to helping people and examining you know potentials here because we do know that with, when it comes to nutrition. 
there is a tremendous and massive individual variance between people. I, I mean, uh, I've worked with people who succeeded and did very well with diets that look the exact opposite of yours. Uh, but I do think there's some general truths. One of the questions I have for you is because a lot of times what we find is we've been working in fitness now for 15 to 20 years and we've interviewed some inc- just incredibly brilliant individuals when it comes to nutrition. And many times it's not so much what someone's eating, it's more what they're avoiding that is giving them the benefits. And you're saying when you went back to keto or threw in more vegetables, you started having some of these negative effects. Are you familiar with uh, the term uh, intestinal hyperpermeability or uh, you know leaky gut syndrome? Yeah, of course, sure. So uh, I, do you, I wonder if that was one of your issues. I wonder if you developed antibodies to some of these foods that you ate a lot of and now just avoiding everything. Do you have any other symptoms of autoimmune? No, I don't think I do. I mean, I you know, like I said, I think that... Uh, you know, there's a transition period. Obviously, you're, you know, you've got a gut microbiome that reacts to what you're eating. You know, there's 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 a period where that flora will will adapt to what you're eating. And so, uh, you know, I think for me and a lot of people, they find that fiber in particular can be very irritating to the intestinal mucosa. I mean, it, it, it is. I mean, there's there's actually some studies that will support that. Uh, you know, our body can sort of defend against that and build up a mucus layer to kind of protect itself and, and, and decrease the permeability there. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, for me, you know, the, the, what I saw was, uh, you know, things that weren't just directly related to gastrointestinal issues. You know, I mean, you know, I can see where your, your gut's inflamed and irritated by particular foods. But then when it goes beyond that, and then all of a sudden you see the same things you saw six months ago when you were doing the same diet. You know, it's like, yeah, but my, my, my knee started hurting mm-hmm. again. And that's what I used to have before when I was doing this chronically. So to me, it says that, you know, there's a period, there's an adaptation period. So if you, you know, if you say, I'm going to go from a carnivore diet to a vegan diet, I'm going to feel crappy for a, for a period of time. And, I'm, and, vi- and, and sort of the, the, the converse is true. If I go from a vegan diet to a carnivore diet, I'm going to feel crappy for about three or four weeks as things sort of transition, as the gut transitions, as, you know, the, 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 the metabolism transitions. But for me, the chronic things that I'd always had, you know, started to show right back up, which means I was already adapted to that stuff. And so when it shows up again with the same foods, to me, it's not not necessarily leaky gut, but it's just the same thing that's bothering me all the time, if that makes sense. Well, so, so uh, God, I don't remember who we talked to who, oh, I think it was Chris Kresser, mm-hmm. who's uh, kind of an expert on that particular subject. And he talks about how, you know, the way you develop these intolerances is, you know, it's typically the foods you eat the most of. And if in the context of inflammation, which, by the way, here's another one for you because you're such an active individual. Uh, gut issues, you know, gut, you know, intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut syndrome, very strongly correlated to people who train intensely. And because intense exercise is a an inflammatory, you know, cause or it can cause lots of systemic inflammation, it kind of sets the stage for this potential problem to happen. And of course, we f- tend to feed ourselves right after a workout. And so we talked about how eating the same foods over and over again, if you have any type of issues with your gut, you know, wall or cell wall, and some of those proteins get through and your body starts to identify them as anti, you know, and starts to create antibodies, that can display itself as issues anywhere because the immune system is everywhere. So someone might get psoriasis or joint pain or, and we see this with people having food intolerances to things that you would consider totally benign you know, that, you know, like I've, I've had uh, clients who would develop food intolerances to avocados or to, you know, beef even, you know, which is a meat, which typically, you know, it's not a super common one. And when you look at food allergies in countries, like the highest rate of like rice allergies are in places like Japan, you know, uh, versus other countries where they don't consume much of them. So, you know, it's just an, it's an interesting thing that's going on. And considering that you exercise so much, do you think maybe that you created this environment to where you became so intolerant to foods that, have a tendency to be because of course things like gluten um processed foods uh certain plants they do contain things that are um more likely to cause a potential autoimmune issue or an issue maybe because they're they're defense mechanisms right have you thought of that for yourself or well i mean you know for me uh you know, I don't think I had an autoimmune disorder. I mean, I just don't have any, you know, evidence that, that, that would support that. I probably had, you know, early metabolic syndrome. Uh, you know, that may contribute to that in some cases. <clears throat> um, you know, what I'm seeing, and again, I, I, I'm only one person, so when I when I look at the, the, the experience of thousands of people that, I'm, that I've been involved with now at this point, 
I'm seeing, I'm seeing, you know, in common people getting rid of psoriasis, eczema, uh, you know, other autoimmune disorders, you know, Crohn's disease, ulcerative mm -hmm. colitis, uh, you know, the whole gamut, you know, hypothyroidism. All those things seem to be working well, you know, on this mono diet, which is, you know, again, and, and uh, for me, you know, I've had nothing but beef for 14 months for the most part. So I haven't developed any issues with that. And I've still exercised just as hard as I've always had. In fact, harder because my recovery is better now. Yeah. Um, well, I think it highlights the fact that for sure humans can do a lot for a certain period of time. Like the average American can eat the average American diet for five years and appear to be healthy. So, um, I mean, besides the self-experimentation you're doing yourself, 14 months isn't technically a long period of time, but it does show that you're not doing anything toxic or creating any nutrient deficiencies, which is another good topic here. Yeah. Uh, the nutrients found in me, people, a lot of people may not realize this. We yeah, talk about talk this about on the vitamin show. C. Yeah, a lot of people uh, don't realize this, but you're far more likely to create a, a nutrient deficiency eating a vegan diet, especially if a natural vegan diet, one you would find if you were a hunter-gatherer, than meat. Meat contains pretty much everything, except for vitamin C. That tends to be a tough one. And I know scurvy was a bit of a problem in the old world because of that. Um, uh, yeah, how do you feel about that? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously I don't have scurvy. I mean, if I, <laughs> yeah, you, scurvy, you don't scurvy, like scurvy is a fatal disease. I mean, yeah. it is. And it usually takes place. Some people say the, the, the symptoms. Pirate, yeah, I'm not so. a pirate. But the <laughs> symptoms show up typically, you know, one month to about four months is typically the, the, the onset of scurvy. And was scurvy. That, that's like bruising and bleeding. Well, I mean, yes, it's a it's a it's a collagen uh, production problem. But you know, you basically you you get open sores. You know, you bleed you bleed into your joint. You have neurological issues. You know, your your gums bleed. Your teeth fall out, and eventually you die. Oh, right? Sounds nasty. So I, I, obviously that hasn't happened to me, and it hasn't happened to thousands of other people who are doing it. So that's something I thought about. But when you look at the, you know, the mechanism of, uh, you know, so there's a, there's a couple things that go to this. So vitamin C is, what do, we, what do we use vitamin C for? One of the functions is for hydroxylating certain proteins or amino acids to, to develop collagen. It's also used as an antioxidant. So we know that humans can't make vitamin C. There are other animals that do make vitamin C. And that's why they don't need to supplement it with that. We know that uh, animals, when they are eating high-carb diets, they make more vitamin C. Because when you have a higher carbohydrate diet, your vitamin C requirement goes up. One of the reasons that that occurs is because we know that the glucose and vitamin C, the, the glucose transporter, it, sorry, the transporter that brings vitamin C in through the intestinal tract and through some other cell membranes is very similar in structure to glucose. And so when glucose is competing with that, the body will preferentially use glucose and utilize vitamin C less. So again, carbohydrate diets increase that requirement for vitamin C. Uh, we also know that, uh, you know, one of the functions of vitamin C is an antioxidant. When you go on a lower carb diet, your endogenous antioxidants, things like glutathione, things like uh, carnosine, things like uh, go through the roof. superoxide dismutase all go up. So your antioxidant capacity is already up. So, that, so the requirements for vitamin C actually go down on low carb ketogenics or, car or carnivorous diets. When you look at historically, well, the people that got scurvy, because we know from the polar expeditions that fresh meat would cure scurvy. We, we know that's absolutely true. But the reason these sailors, these British sailors, these limeys, you would get vitamin C deficiencies is because they were eating dried meats, dried salted meats that didn't have the vitamin C content in there. And they were eating a high carb, what they call hardtack, which is like biscuits and stuff like that. So they had a hard, high carb diet. They had dried out meat that didn't have any vitamin C in it. And, and But actually, meat does have vitamin C. The USDA, and this is something that, again, an Amber O'Hearn discovered, they never tested. They never tested meat for vitamin C. They just said assumed what? to be zero. They never even bothered to test so it. So wow. some independent labs show that a pound of meat has something like uh, 10 milligrams of vitamin C. So that's basically enough to prevent scurvy. So if you eat a pound of beef a day, you're not going to get scurvy. And I eat, you know, me, I eat four pounds of beef a day. So I don't have scurvy. And there's another study, uh, these guys, there's a group out of Hungary called Paleo Medicina. That they're running, they have what they call a paleolithic ketogenic diet, which is basically an all meat diet for most people. They're using that fancy term so they don't sound crazy, like you know, you tell people <laughs> all meat, you all meat diet, you sound like crazy. But if you call it paleolithic ketogenic, it doesn't sound crazy anymore. It's fancy, right? It's kind of but, science. -y. But, but they're yeah, but they're they're putting all these people on all all meat diets, and they're finding that again, that's like I'm seeing, all these diseases are going away, right? All these crazy autoimmune diseases are going away. But the other thing they saw is that the bioavailability for vitamin C derived from animal based products was much better than they saw it from plant-based products. Like like we see it with a lot of other issues. With, most with, nutrients. Yeah, with most nutrients. They also saw that, you know, supplementation of exogenous vitamin C doesn't work very well. Same thing with antioxidants. One of the things 
the people from the plant-based world, like you got to get all your antioxidants from your, you know, your berries and your superfoods. Antioxidants derived exogenously don't work very well for humans. Most of them, they get to the gut and they're, they're destroyed by our gastric processes. So we don't even absorb most of that stuff. So all this, you know, all this sort of branch chain amino acids yeah, that everyone's I mean, well, showing down. All this down. stuff that everybody's showing, it's like it doesn't even get to the body anyway. You know, it mm-hmm. may work in a cell culture, but it doesn't actually work in humans. We have our own endogenous antioxidant system that works very well for us. This plant derived stuff, plants don't make this stuff for our benefit. It, you know, all these plant phytonutrients are basically just pesticides. They're trying, they're trying to get people to stop eating. Now, we've kind of co-opted some of those and can show that they have certain functions and, and a medicinal purpose for some some reason. Sometimes that works, but they're not designed for us. You know, they're not really, we have our own systems that work better. Mm. I, I think when I, when I look at plants you and the plants that people eat nowadays, they're so different from, uh, I guess, natural plants or the way that we, we used to eat them. Uh, wheat, for example, looks nothing like the wheat that, you know, that's humans ate for thousands of years at the beginning of the agricultural revolution. And we definitely are in the middle of an autoimmune epidemic. Um, I don't, you know, I, I mean, you're older than I am. I mean, how many kids do you remember when you were in school with food allergies? There were yeah. al- almost none. And they're everywhere now. And I, 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 Honestly, don't think I don't necessarily. I'm not. I don't think carnivore diets is is great for everybody. That's just my honest opinion. But I do think avoiding some of the stuff for people who are in this state might be a good thing. And it's obvious the anecdote is quite is quite powerful. I'm one of those individuals, so I don't eat carnivore diet. I can't. I tried. I tried. Absolutely was not good for uh, my gut. However, um, I do avoid uh, most grains because when I do eat them, I do get gut issues. That's how my my issues tend to show up. But I do know people who get things like inflammation. And stuff like that. Now, I want to ask you something about the vitamin C. You said it was used to make collagen from, um, was, it, was it with amino acids or was well, it from- lysine and proline, hydroxylysine, hydroxyproline, okay. typically is how, how that's made. Could, uh, could the increase in vitamin C from uh, you know, a higher carbohydrate diet be required because of the reduction in those amino acids? In other words, if I'm eating a high-carb diet and I'm, an a- and I'm an animal, I'm probably not eating a lot of- you know, proline and other amino acids and probably lower protein. Therefore, I may need more vitamin C to convert more collagen. And on the flip side, as, an, as somebody eating meat, I'm going to be consuming a lot of collagen, or at least I should be, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're in steak, you know, 3% of muscle is collagen. So this is one of the things that people are always, you know, they're talking about, I got to have my collagen supplement. So I'm just, just eat a damn steak. You're getting plenty of collagen if you do that, you know, particularly if you eat some of the, you know, the fascial stuff that comes around and cuts a steak and, and, and that's usually tender once you cook it. So... Uh, but yeah, potentially. I don't, you know, I don't know that we have a good study that, that demonstrates that for sure. But certainly, you know, if you're on a certainly if you're on a vegetarian diet, you're not going to get as much amino acids. You know, mm-hmm. we, we know that it's harder to obtain the the amount and the correct uh, you know the correct ratios. Uh, it's it's just more difficult to do. So yeah, I think the there's a number of things. You know, we can also look at vitamin D. We can also look at things like magnesium. All these things are commonly deficient, but those requirements again go up on a high carbohydrate diet and again this this group out of hungary is starting to demonstrate this stuff and looking at populations that, you know these these arctic populations eating their native diets you know despite no sunlight you know they live up in the polar circle they have excellent vitamin d levels and they're eating reindeer you know that's mm-hmm. that's their diet and so they're seeing that and same thing with magnesium one of the things they saw is that as magnesium as glucose levels go up magnesium levels tend to decline and so we have these and we know that magnesium is a, is a very important cofactor again for carbohydrate ma- metabolism so many people are magnesium deficient so many people are eating these high carb diets that uh, potentially is creating that deficiency is creating it's driving an increased requirement and then we also know that magnesium is is bound into fiber phytates and things like that come in plants block the absorption of magnesium. So you're not only you're incre- recreating a higher requirement, but you're also making it more difficult to, to, to get. So I got to yeah. ask, and this is, I know the audience is all thinking this, uh, like what's your bowel movements like? Yeah. yeah. Do you, do like, you, let's talk about that. Is it daily like, or is it? Like, <laughs> you know, I am tempted. I mean, I'm going to get personal I, here. I'm, I'm tempted to literally to do like a live blog of me taking a bowel. <laughs> that's like, that question all the time. Like, does yeah. it happen? Yeah. yeah no, I have, a, I have a pretty much a regular bowel movement every day. Now, it's not as big as it used to be because I'm just i not wasting as much material. You know, all that fiber, you, it just runs through your system. You not can't digest bulk. it. It's not as much bulk, but I have a regular normal bowel movement. I don't have constipation. I don't strain. Uh, you know, it, after about a couple weeks, once you transition over, it's fine. You know, the, the problem people don't understand, this is, a, this is this, you know, there's a lot of sort of propaganda out there and a lot of it's sort of vegan directed. 
you know, this whole thing that meat sits there and rots in your colon and sits there. It's ridiculous. There's no evidence. So if you talk to any gastroenterologist, mm. they'll tell you that meat is extremely well, we're well capable of absorbing and uh, uh, digesting meat. I mean, we're, we're just made for that. That's why we, we have a hydrochloric acid derived system. You know, our gastric pH is one five. It's among the lowest of any animal on earth because we digest meat, because we probably start out as scavenger animals, evolutionary, I think. But, you know, and there's ileostomy patients, patients who have their colon removed, and they can sit there and watch. You feed them meat, what comes out? Just a little bit of liquid. You feed them a bunch of vegetables, all that corn and all that stuff just passes right on through. So meat is really well absorbed. So you're just not making much waste product. And so you're, mm. you know, you're really absorbing all that nutrition. So it's, it's very, you know, it's just very good quality, highly bioavailable nutrition. And that's why I think a lot of people that I've seen uh, are feeling better. You know, they're, they're, I think their nourishment status, their, their nutrition status goes up, and a lot of people are noticing, you know, that they're getting, you know, they're getting stronger and they're putting on muscle and, and that sort of stuff, which is interesting. I think that's kind of the newest, because most people that have done this, you know, out of desperation, because who's going to go on a freaking all meat diet? You got to be crazy. You got to be desperate to do that. So these people that had all these health issues, kind of pioneered some of this stuff, at least in Western society. You know, if you go up and talk, I was talking to a gal yesterday. She's from Mongolia, and she's like. That's no big deal. I mean, we all do that. I mean, we eat a damn, we eat a whole sheep in a day, you know. <laughs> yeah. So for them, it's normal. But in, in, in America and Western society, it's like, well, it's crazy. You're eating meat. You know, if meat's so bad for it, it's going to kill you. But these people that do that, that have initially done this were these desperate people that had all these autoimmune diseases and gastrointestinal mm-hmm. issues, and they solve those issues. Now you got guys like me or athletes doing it and saying, wait a minute, my, my athletic performance has gotten better. I've gotten stronger. And now I can tell you I've got guys, I've got New Zealand, a New Zealand All Black that's doing this. I'm getting stronger. I'm getting leaner. I'm getting bigger. He's one of the best athletes in the world. MMA fighters, uh, wow. professional baseball players, power. We've got the Canadian powerlifting, like 165 Canadian powerlifting federation national record holder. He's blowing away his lifts, you know, and he's a drug free guy. He says, I started this for, you know, he pulled his 165. He pulled a 630 bed deadlift with, with no belt. Jeez. Wow. And he says, it's easy. It's the easiest ever been in my life. So there's something here nutrition wise. Now, again, to your point, is it right for everybody? I don't know. Maybe not. I would say from an evolutionary status, you know, how long have we been meat, eating meat as humans? You know, if you, if you, if you assume the human genus, and I go back to Homo habilis, you know, not Homo sapiens, but Homo habilis, Homo agaster, Homo erectus, all those, that's what human, that's, that's the definition of human. Now, Homo sapien is, is, is one variant among humans, but humans have been eating meat at least 3 million years. So it's a highly, highly evolutionary conserved uh, a property we have. And if we look what drove our evolution, why can I? Why do? Why do I have big, strong, powerful th- shoulders that I can throw stuff? I mean, I wasn't throwing it fruit, you know, because I, I could climb the trees before, right? That's not. That's not why we developed the capacity to throw. Yeah. You know, it's estimated that a human can throw a spear, you know, with an atlatl, which is what those spear throws that were developed thirty thousand years ago, uh, eighty miles an hour, a hundred mm-hmm. yards, right? And that's based on a modern human. What we know about humans before pre-agriculture is. They were bigger and they were stronger than we were, you know, because what happened mm. after we adopted agriculture? Our brain shrunk by about 200 cc's, our height shrunk by about six inches, our bones got smaller, and our muscle attachments got smaller. So we were probably, you know, there, there's, a, there's a population called the Gravedians. They were these uh, uh, mammoth hunters. I mean, that was their specialty. They lived in Central Europe. Their average height, you know, back 30,000 years ago was something like six foot two which is bigger than any modern human height. The, height, the biggest wow, even modern there. human height population right now is six foot. These are the guys from Netherlands and Central Europe, Croatia, and stuff like that. So these are like the biggest, strongest, hmm. baddest guys on the planet living 30,000 wow. years ago, eating nothing but meat, you know, or, or mostly meat. You know, they probably, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say that we are always carnivorous, but you know, I think at times when we're living in an ice age, you know, what, what's available to us? You know, you don't have, you don't right. have whole we foods. We ate what we could eat, right? You don't have whole foods. And, you know, this thing, this, you know, I've got this wide variety of fruits and vegetables and I, that I can piece together all this nutrition. That was not on the menu 30,000 years ago. There's no way it was. You know, you couldn't go to the, to the store and, and buy blueberries and, and, and uh, bananas and strawberries and kale and spirulina and all this stuff. I mean, you had what you had. And most of it in, in, in ice age times, it's going to be a big ruminant animal because it's grassland. It's not we're living on ice. We're not living on glaciers, but we're living adjacent to that stuff. And when the weather gets cold, it dries out. When it dries out, grassland develops. When grassland develops, what eats what eats grass? These big roaming animals. Humans don't do very good eating grass, and so that's probably what we you know now eat for a large Sh- part of time. Sean, you talked you touched on a lot of like uh, nutrients that uh, I think a lot of people supplement. I'd like to hear your opinion on just the supplement industry as a whole. What are your thoughts on that and do you use any supplements at all? 
Yeah, the only th- if you consider salt a supplement, that's the only thing I take. I don't take vitamin C. I don't, you know, I, again, we talked about it. I don't take hormones. I don't take supplements. I don't take drugs. Um, you know, I don't take vitamin C. I don't take any of that stuff, you know, and, and, and it hasn't left me any worse for when I was when I was initially, I was using a little caffeine. I don't drink coffee, but I was using some caffeine as, a, as kind of a pre work caffeine pill as a pre workup type thing. But then I stopped doing it because I wanted to be part of this study I did. I, I did my own study with a big group of, you know, this N equals many. We did mm. several hundred people. So I, so I said, because I didn't want anybody doing that to confound things, I stopped taking caffeine and I haven't noticed any negative effect at all whatsoever. So I think, you know, yes, there's this sort of mindset that we have now that you got to have a supplement, you got to have a pre workout, you got to do all this stuff. And, you know, obviously it's a big business, it's a big industry behind that stuff. Uh, and so there's a lot of people that are going to push that. But I, I just, you know, if you look at most animals in the wild, and I will argue that human beings are basically animals. I mean, we're just a damn animal. We're just a good animal that knew how to hunt stuff, and we got pretty smart. But, you know, most animals in the wild are not supplementing. They know what they're supposed to eat. You know, and the question is, you know, what's the right diet for a human? And that's up, up for debate, obviously. But I can tell you that from my experience, you know, as I look at the human animal, you know, we evolved because we hunted. I mean, that's what drove our evolution in a lot. That's why we're different from chimpanzees and gorillas and other primates. You look at the evolutionary adaptations that we've made. Again, the shoulder motion, the ability to throw, the brain size, the thinking capacity, that hunting as a a predator animal requires more intelligence than a prey animal. Prey animal just has to stick his head down on the ground, eat the food, and then run. The, the, The strategy that's required to hunt an animal is much more complicated. It requires better communication skills, better organization and planning. So that's some of that drove our brain growth. Our gut, you know, if we look at a chimpanzee's gut, it is much, much, has a much huger colon than we do. You know, our colon has shrunk down significantly. And one of the reasons is because the chimpanzees have this huge fermentation capacity. So they can take all this, uh, and it's even smaller than a gorilla. A gorilla's got even more fermentation capacity but it, it, because they're hindgut fermenters. So they ferment everything in their colon and their cecum, which humans have lost most of that capacity. And so as we see... Uh, you know, these evolutionary adaptations that occur because we hunt, because we obtain meat. Uh, and then the fact that you think about it, what other animal on the, on the planet can eat whales, can eat birds, can eat lions, can eat buffalo, can eat snails. We can eat anything. I mean, we, can, we have killed and eaten every animal on the planet. Not that I'm an advocate of killing all these animals, but humans have demonstrated that capacity. There is no other animal on the planet that has done that. Lions have never eaten whales. You know, you know, there's, 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 just, there's just nothing. You know, sharks have never eaten, probably they've never eaten cows, you know, unless one falls <laughs> in the water. But, but, you know, you think about that. Humans have been so adaptable and we've, we've got all across the planet because we were able to follow and kill and, and obtain nutrition from all these different animals. So we are carnivorous apex predators. My argument is that largely is our food. Now, you can supplement it with plant food. It's, it's a less efficient uh, way to get nutrition for, without a doubt. Um, and there are some, there's, you know, I challenge anybody to go outside and go eat all the plants that you want without going to the grocery store oh, you'll and die. survive. You'll die. You'll no die. So you can't, we can't say that humans got from Africa to Europe, to Asia, across the Bering Strait, to North America, to South America, and all these islands relying on plant food because it wasn't consistent. You're not going to find, you know, you're not going to find the same plant foods everywhere. So if certain plants are required, which they're not then you would expect you'd have to find that in every geographic area that you go to. We don't need to do that. We, you know, because we can eat almost every animal on the planet. There's like a puffer fish you don't want to eat. Maybe polar bear liver is a little toxic, but in general, if there's an animal, it's on the menu. We can eat it. And so that's why I think that uh, this to me, from that standpoint makes sense. And then if you look at the people that are doing it, you know. Now, do you, do you see any, sorry, do you see any benefits of you rotating your meats or do you stick to basic, to basic, I don't think, you know, here's, here's, and this is another kind of, because people say, well, you got to eat liver, you got to, you know, you got to I was going to ask gotta, about organ meats. I don't eat any, I don't eat any organ meats. And mm-hmm. I, it's just because I don't really care for, I mean, I'll, I'll take the back. I went to, Fo, not Fogo de Chão, one of these Brazilian places in Denver. And I mean, I <laughs> I sat there and I just had a big feast. And one of the, one of the things I had was chicken hearts on there. So mm-hmm. I'll have some, some chicken hearts. Uh, but that was the only organ meat I ate all in 2017. And I had no deficiencies, no issues whatsoever with that. Uh, when I was in Iceland uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had some friggin' uh, ram's testicles because I was trying oh. all the crazy <laughs> shit. You know, I was like shark, fermented <laughs> shark, and whale blubber, and all this crazy. You know, lamb's head. You know, they give you this whole friggin' head sitting there looking at you with the teeth and eyes. You're like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. So, but I mean, I tried all that stuff. <laughs> but I mean, you know, here's this is a this is a, and 
I think nutrition should be simple. I think if you if, if I can explain how to eat to my dog, it shouldn't take a calculator and a macronutrient thing or a line. You say, here's your food, eat it, you'll do fine. So for me, um, this is what I believe, and I think it's bearing out. You know, if we look at what we're made, we're made out of animal tissue. You and I are, we're made out of red meat. I've cut a lot of people open. I can tell you we're made out of red meat. Uh, you know, and animal tissue, you know, animal cells, what's in an animal cell? You know, what's required to make that cell run? Every vitamin and nutrient that, that it needs, right? So if my muscle cell requires vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, potassium, calcium, it's in there, right? It has to be to make it run. So if I eat that in sufficient quantity, if I eat enough animal cell tissues, I'm going to get what I need. And that's why I don't have nutrient deficiencies. That's why at 51 years of age, I can dunk basketballs and break rowing world records and rep out 500 pounds on a deadlift. That's not nutrition de nutritional deficiency. Right. That's thriving in my mind. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, that's the most, you know, if we, if we try to simplify things, you know, just Occam's Razor, Razor's Principle, the most simple thing that makes sense to me is, is that. You know, mm -hmm. it's not that the Inuit were somehow sneaking berries and somehow they were getting enough muck tuck to, to cover their vitamin C needs. It's that meat has what you need, and it's just that simple. And it's it's, it's a, I, I won't disagree with you at all on that. I mean, uh, for sure, if you just eat meat, you're not going to have a nutrient deficiency, or at least the likelihood is extremely small compared to if you're a vegan. If you're a vegan, and we've talked about this before on the show, um, to be a vegan rec means you need to be pretty well planned. You have to plan out your diet. You have to have a lot of variety. You have to have access to fruits and vegetables that um, wouldn't necessarily grow naturally near each other. You would you would have you know terrible uh, deficiencies. But the other side of this is the other side of that is this is that uh, and yes, you are 100 percent correct. We are the most successful hunters, and that is why we throw. That is, there's and that's also why we probably are so good at walking upright. We probably out track out tracked animals. In fact. We can outtrack almost any animal on Earth, including horses, um, and this is uh, another fact. So we are exceptional hunters, and that's probably why, or one of the reasons why we were able to succeed as well as we did. But we were also opportunistic, and if there's a plant or a berry or nut or seed, we ate it. You know, nobody turned it down because there's this side of it, and that's although fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, or plants that grow naturally aren't as nutrient dense or as calorie dense. Very few cases we find a calorie dense uh, fruit or vegetable. You might find, you know, Nuts. coconut or something like that. But usually they're not very energy dense. But you don't have to kill them, and you don't have to run them down, and you don't have to expend a lot of energy chasing them. Um, and they probably won't kill you, except for unless you eat poison. So they do have their benefits in that case. And I know the Inuits, although they do eat for the most part uh, all animal product, you know, seal and seal blubber and you know caribou, whatever. They do a couple times a year. They do eat some plants, don't they? Yeah, I mean, you know, it depends. It depends which population because there's inland rain in there, in, inland uh, Inuit that live up with the reindeer. There's some live coastal stuff, and so they have different access to different stuff like that. And so, yeah, certainly I agree. We're opportunists. You know, we'll you know we'll eat a Twinkie if it's in front of us. I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. You know, it's like you know, it's, again, in I, excess. I, I'll use a comparison to a, a modern house cat. What is a what is a house cat? I mean, what do we what what is a cat? We we consider that a carnivore, right? right. Cats eat, right now, cats eat a bunch of grains. Yeah. I mean, and they're fat and they're getting sick, but they have that opportunity. They're opportunists. They'll eat what's put in front of them. Mm -hmm. Is it ideal for them? That's questionable. You know, I don't, I don't think it is. Um, but yeah, certainly, I mean, you know, we would have eaten anything that would have given us nutrition if we had to. Now, if we look at some of those, like some of the berries that used to grow back then, you know, we knew they were smaller. They were, they were less, less sugar, less energy in those things. And it would require probably a fair bit of energy expenditure to gather enough berries to, to see how much it would take to get from a, killing a lamb, you know, because a lamb's, all that fat is energy dense, obviously. True, true. And so, you know, I don't know. I, I, I would, you know, again, the evolutionary arguments are always neat to talk about, mm -hmm. but until somebody invents a time machine, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. It's all speculation. So what I like to do is say, let's, let's, let's look at the dudes doing it in 2018 and what are they doing? You know, like me, I'm eating just steak. I'm doing fine, you know. And so to me, that's more informative to, to talk about physiology and what really happens sure. is, is the proof's in the pudding. You can, you know, you can speculate about the anatomy, the biochemistry, and, you know, history and, and evolution. But, you know, you're never going to know that stuff for sure. Even all the biochemistry is constantly evolving. You know, all this stuff we think we know, we have all these people telling us this is the latest study on, you know, lima beans or coffee or whatever, whatever, whatever nutrient. 
that stuff changes every couple of years. And then all of a sudden you got these people, you know, it generates a lot of supplements. You know, oh yeah, we got to all take this and somebody's going to sell a bunch of supplements. So we spend two or three years taking coenzyme Q or chromium piconolate and all this crap that, you know, I don't know if you guys remember that. I do. Like, well, I day, yeah. yeah, it's like, oh yeah, I got to take that stuff. And then it's like, well, it didn't even work. You know, honestly, what I tell people is, you know, if you're going to take a supplement, you know, it better have a friggin' powerful effect or it's just a waste of time. You know, it's expensive urine. What I'm seeing with these big, huge, and again, a lot of people talk about moderation and balance. You don't really notice anything. And maybe it's a little bit of placebo. You're like, ah, oh, maybe I felt a little better. You know, this stuff, what I'm seeing, it's like punch yourself, punch yourself in the face, knock yourself on the ass. Wow, that's a huge difference, you know, for, for a lot of these people. Like, my chronic back pain, not me, but people will say that it's been bothering me for 15 years, went away completely in mm -hmm. two weeks. That to me is powerful. You don't get that from taking some BS supplement a lot of times. It's like, uh, yeah, maybe Dave Asprey told me it was going to help me. And, you know, he's going to live to be 180 because he takes 150 pills a day. It's ridiculous. I doubt it. Mind. Well, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I can sit here and say I'm going to live to be 180. Here, buy my crap. I yeah. mean, but it's just, it's just to me, it's misleading. And the people that fall for that, it's the same thing like, you know, with this, well, I won't go on, on a vegan rant right now. But No, I, I've, been, I've been trying to get you yeah. to get on a rant because I think it you so calm, but I would think that uh, a lot of this stuff. I'm sure you're getting attacked left and right. Yeah, by right. You know, it's, you know, here's a problem, you know, and, and I, I don't care what you eat. You know, you eat whatever you want to eat. You know, do whatever makes you healthy. And I think that's, you know, but objectively assess if you're actually healthy or not. Don't just do it because you think you're healthy, you know, or you think mm. it's the right thing to do. If you're not flat out getting healthier, and you should be able to feel, you should be able to tell that. You should be able to feel this stuff. It should be obvious to you. Uh, then, 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 then that's not the right thing for you. But do what makes you be healthy. But uh, this is a problem. You know, the, the, there's a big propaganda arm on, the, on this vegan stuff, and not and many of them are great people, nice. But I know a lot of them are good. But there are just some that are just so politicized and almost kind of a, a religious man. That's you know, like me. I, I say eat all meat. It's fine if you want to do it, but I don't care what you eat. You don't have to do that. You're not going to save the planet by eating meat. Uh, and it's not my concern. My concern is what do whatever makes you feel better from a health standpoint. But these people are like. If you don't eat it, you're you're a murderer. I mean, I had a lady who literally said, "If my kids ate animal products, I would kill my children." I'm wow, like, that what? is that's insanity. Yeah, that's, wow. that's crazy. That? There's another guy that slit his own throat to scar his throat to honor the animals that were sacrificed. Yeah, I'm like, you guys are nutty. You know what? That's it. That's misplaced. Uh, and I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm not going to piss people off, but it's misplaced uh, empathy. I mean, humans evolved empathy to be empathetic towards each other. And then we extended it towards animals that benefited us, like horses and dogs. And and then they just, you know, in modern societies, I think people, maybe they feel they need to, you know, they don't have empathy towards well, because humans. because we have that, we have that towards, fucking luxury. We didn't have that luxury. You know yeah. what I'm saying? We wouldn't be that empathetic if it was how you had to survive, So right? they put it towards all animals. And <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, but you're not, you're not not eating vegetables because you feel bad for the vegetables. You know what I'm saying? It's not like you're trying to save, right. trying to yeah, save I'm not, plants. I'm not trying to save tomatoes. You right, know? right. That's, you know, that's <laughs> not, my, not my goal here. I mean, I'm, I'm just doing what works for me well. I, you know, call me greedy, call me uh, selfish, but I want to be healthy and, and perform as good as I can. You know, I've been criticized, you know, because they're saying, oh, you're only eating that way because you want to have muscles. I'm like, yeah, I do want to have muscles. <laughs> muscles are important for your health. And this is people that, that don't understand that. Especially as you age. Yeah, That's absolutely. A big one. It's a huge one. It's important to maintain your strength. We know quality of life and longevity are tied into mu muscle mass or what's strength. The, what's the saying in medicine, like uh, break your hip and then die of pneumonia? Or yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the mortality rate after a broken hip, you know, with one, mm -hmm. you know, you break your hip within one year, 40% of people are going to be dead. You know, wow. and why do they break their hip? It's because they're weak. They're weak. They're frail. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have obviously an, ep an obesity epidemic, but we have a frailty epidemic. Mm -hmm. We have an issue with people that, you know, they're, they're literally, their very structure is, is tenuous. I mean, their bones are weak, their muscles are, they're sarcopenic, their muscles, their muscles are weak, their kidney size is small, their, their hearts are small, their brains are shrinking. All of that is due to poor nutrition. Even if you're obese, you're malnourished in in most cases, and you're probably malnourished because you're not getting enough animal product. I mean that, and you're probably not getting enough protein. I know there's a big push that protein is bad. There's a whole camp on this mTOR, you know, camp about sure. you know if you if you if you stimulate mTOR, you're going to die and you're going to get cancer. Well, that I I don't think you can extrapolate that evidence into the to human beings yet. I mean that's 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 no. It's, it depends on context. In fact, Absolutely. we have a, we have a right. good friend that uh, it, that talks about this all the time and. mTOR is also uh, what stimulates muscle growth and recovery, but in the context of inflammation, in the context of cancer, 
mTOR will drive cancer to become more malignant and grow and spread. Same thing with insulin-like growth factor. Yep. Uh, but in a context of low inflammation, probably it, it's not a problem. At least we haven't seen it uh, to be a problem. So yeah, that's the problem. A lot of these labs, people get a lab and then what's your whatever value? And I'm like, it has it's context dependent. Yeah. How what it, yeah? What is the context in 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 the in the uh, setting of inflammation or hyperinsulinemia or these other things? And so. Yeah, to, to extrapolate that from a from a nematode or a mouse study or a cell culture study to me is dangerous. You know, we know what happens to people when they restrict their protein, particularly as they age. They end up frail, they break their hip. Look at a nursing home, look at these people, look at their mm-hmm. diet, look what they're eating, and look at their health. They're they're just frail as can be. But back to the vegan stuff, you know, here's the thing. They're taking, you know, they're going after these kids now in, in grade school. You know, yeah. my, my kids, my kids are kids are getting this message and they're they're ten years old, eating animals to bed. You know, I got to counter counter that all the time. I, sh- I give my daughter a piece of ribeye, and she okay, it's better now. But you know, it's, it's kinda, you know, but I mean, it's it's just because they're it's almost like the, the smoking industry. They're preying on the youth. Mm. They're driving towards this stuff. They're trying to Disneyify nature. You know, it's not Zootopia. You know, it's not where we have <laughs> right. the you know the the, the fox and, and the and the and the rabbit are hanging out and, and best friends. No, they eat each other in the wild. Yeah, that's just, that's what really happens. Nature but we is have brutal. This, but we have these kids, you know, and most of these vegans are 18, 19, 20, 25 year old guys are just kids in my view. And they're very, they're very, you know, um, uh, super, super excited. They're very, you know, they're very, they're, they're really hyped up to do this stuff. And, you know, what happens is because at that age, they still have a lot of physiologic reserve. I mean, they're still young. Their systems are working. They can they're get not, away with shit. Yeah, they can, they can get, you know, anybody, we could all get away with that Right, stuff. they can live on the Twinkie diet and be all right. Yeah, but I mean, so, they're, so they're seeing this stuff and they're thinking, well, I feel good. And, you know, if they, if they go on a vegan diet and they drop all this process and they drop the Twinkies out and they feel better for the first few months, they're like, oh, it's the greatest, greatest thing in the world. But what they don't see is, you know, you know, three months, you know, six months down the road, five years down the road, all these people are dropping out. They're having a hard time. And I see all these people that come from veganism and they're like, you know, I got depressed. I just depleted, you know, my, my teeth got bad. You know, I, I all these autoimmune issues. Mm-hmm. And, you know, th- that's what they're not seeing. They're not publicizing this stuff. And, you know, if you look at some of the biggest you know, proponents of this stuff, they don't look particularly healthy to me, at least the, the older ones. You know, like I said, I'm, I, I like to put out, I'm a guy in my 50s. You know, I don't see a lot of vegans doing what I do in my 50s, you know, just, just to put that contrast out there from a from an overall health standpoint. But it's, uh, you know, it, it's something that the, the, there has to be a counter message. And even if, uh, you know, I have to do the, the entertainment stuff, mm-hmm. you know, do the stuff that's kind of a little outrageous just to say, look, there, there's there we're, we're going in a direction. You know, man went plant based 10,000 years ago you know, when we adopted agriculture. I mean, that's when we, we, we did this big push. And right now our diet, the U.S. diet is about 75, 80 percent plant based as it is now. Now, mo- most of that stuff is wheat, soy. Corn. corn and sugar. I mean, but well, that's still plant-based stuff. And so I don't know that saying you got to eat more Brussels sprouts is, is necessarily the right order. I think, you know, we need to get back to what we might've been eating 20,000 years ago. And, and that would undoubtedly include more animal, animal, animal products. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Uh, for, for the most part, uh, what you're saying um, in terms of, you know, I do think people do need to eat more animal stuff and I don't think all plants are created equal. I, so wheat, you know, the reason why we eat so much wheat, soy and corn is because they're, we figured out how to grow them. We, of course, were able to modify a couple of them so we could you know, spray the hell out of them and, and it makes it easier to harvest them and whatnot. But even if we go back thousands of years when, you, when humans did eat some plants and stuff, it wasn't two crops. You know, It was you know, whatever was around you. So it was very, very different. Now, let's talk about, you, you mentioned depression and people who eat uh, you know, mostly a vegetarian, very vegetarian diet. And actually, this is a real statistic, by the way. So you know, uh, you know, you're not making this up. I've seen this. I've read this. You can look this up. There is a strong correlation to um, not eating or at least having low amounts of natural creatine in your diet and having low amount and having low cholesterol. So cholesterol is a big one because we were taught uh, as kids that cholesterol had to be low. The lower, the better. But when you look at the literature. Uh, low low cholesterol is very strongly correlated with all cause mortality and uh, depression and cancer. Like if your cholesterol is really low and you have cancer, the odds that you're not going to survive it are much higher. So my question for you is uh, twofold. You know, let's talk about cholesterol for a second. And have you had 
your blood test done and what do your numbers look like? And let's, dig, let's dig into that. All right. So let me just answer the second question first. Yes, I've had my numbers done. I know what they look like, but I'm going to share them on Rob Wolf's podcast. Did you promise him you can't? <laughs> I promise him, yeah. So, so, but I will tell Fucking you. Fucking Rob. I will tell you. He's that, our friend. He said yeah. it's cool. No, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, tell actually else. Rob has got a bunch of crazy new tests he wants me to take too that are, that are probably more advanced indicators and some of that stuff. But I will tell you, I'm happy with my labs. Um, in general, and uh, I'll share about those things, you know, in a couple of weeks on Rob's show. But, um, but yeah, you're right. If you look at co- the cholesterol associational studies, and again, associational studies, you have to take them with a grain of salt because they're only associational studies. But there is a pretty consistent uh, dichotomy on on on, the, on on these studies with cholesterol. You know, certainly, you know, there was a study on males. You know, m- males that had low cholesterol were seven times as likely to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. You know, and and so. There probably is something there, and I think you know your brain is made out of a lot of cholesterol, right? And so we, you know, we're made. You out need of, it. You know, we need it. It's part of our body. So this, 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 this mad attempt to suppress it and get rid of it and drive it down as low as possible is, to my, to my, in my view, just insanity, and it's causing a lot of problems. Do you but think it's the pharmaceutical industry because well, they, I mean, they discovered a yeah, way to lower it with right, a drug? Right. I mean, you know, it would be funny if they said, "Well, we got to," you know, I, I, I just sit there and. and uh, you know, in my mind, think of this. You know, this, this pharmaceutical meeting. They said, "Hey guys, we got a drug that lowers. We got, we got. We, here's cholesterol. We got drug. We don't have drugs that can raise it, but we got drugs that can lower it. Well, then, then we got to make low cholesterol the good thing. Mm. You know, and so, but yeah, there, you know, it's a multi-billion-dollar industry, obviously, and I think that's falling apart. There's people starting to question that on a lot of different levels. Um, some people are saying maybe the effects are not even related to to, to cholesterol. Maybe there's an infl- anti-inflammatory effect to some of these drugs, and so. Maybe we should just focus on getting rid of the inflammation instead. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, there's some people that speculate like if you if you look at people that go to the hospital for for a heart attack, their cholesterol will drop after they've had the heart attack, and so we think that cholesterol is actually being used to prepare things. So we're using up all that cholesterol to take care of the damage. That's one of the thoughts on you know the propagation of atherosclerosis. It's not that there's cholesterol, you know, in the vessel. You know, the reason it got there is just trying to do its job to repair stuff. And after so, you work out, too. After right, you lift yeah, weights right, really yeah. heavy, your your cholesterol right, actually right. drops. Yeah, so it's a, it's a repair mechanism for our body. The same thing, like I said, when you work out. I will tell you that, you know, because I, I did these labs, I kind of repeated some of that. I noticed things like my C-reactive protein, my liver function test, and some of those other things change in response to exercise. And we know that. So that's why when I tell people... You know, you go get your cholesterol tested once or twice a year. You look at one number, and I'm like, man, that stuff could have changed, you know, uh, significantly based on what you did in the last few days. And so people get so hung up on that, and it's like they put invest so much energy and anxiety into this one little number. And I'm like, man, that stuff is so changeable day to day. You know, there's a guy named Dave Feldman who's been doing this. I don't know if you know about this guy, but interesting guy. He went on a ketogenic diet. Again, he felt the same thing. He felt great, right? Uh, everything's I'm, I'm leaner I'm, I'm stronger my libido's better everything about me feels better i went to the doctor my total cholesterol was 400 right and the doctor's like oh my god you're gonna die right mm-hmm. so he said this doesn't make sense to me so he started just checking his own cholesterol he he got labs he oh said, i did read about this guy right so he found out that his cholesterol he can change his cholesterol 100 points which is a shit ton in a week and wow. so if your cholesterol can huh. change 100 points in a week how good is it to just to measure it once a year mm. and, and based all your health care on that and going on these drugs that you may or may not need? It's like, you know, it's like taking the, the temperature on January 1st and saying, ah, that's the temperature for the year. <laughs> yeah. right. it's, just, it's, it's madness in my view. But I mean, it's, you know, so I think we have to come away from that. Sean, stuff. Did, you, did you have a pivotal moment in your career where this stuff started to kind of add up where you're like, I'm so over this. Imagine when you first come out of school and you're, you're probably ambitious and excited to start your career and you're about helping people. And then was there a moment where you started to realize like, fuck, is this really about the people or is this more about money? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you first come out, it takes a long time. It takes, you know, five, 10 years to really learn your craft, you know, you, you know cause you're just learning, you're trying to learn, do mm-hmm. as good as you can, you know, learn how to operate learn how to take care of patients, do the best you can. And then after a while, you know, because when I, when I went into orthopedics, one of the reasons I liked orthopedics, you know, because I had a sports background, there's a lot of musculoskeletal stuff in there. But, you know, it's one of those fields where you can make an immediate impact. Somebody comes in there and breaks their femur. You know, they got bones sticking out. You can take them to the operating room, put a big metal rod down there, and they can be walking the next day, right? That's cool stuff, right? That's one of the nice things about orthopedics. Mm-hmm. But what you come to find out is, 
most of what you see, that's kind of the rare stuff, you know, mm. for, the, for the average guy. Most of what you're seeing is you're seeing chronic disease. I mean, all you're seeing yep. is the orthopedic manifestations of chronic disease, and it's probably... Ooh, let's back you know, up for a second. You just sure. said something incredible. Orthopedic manifestations of chronic disease. What sure, do you mean by sure. that? Well, I think a lot of the, the tendinopathy, we see the tendinitis, the tendinosis, the arthritis, is probably just, you know, how our musculoskeletal system displays underlying systemic inflammation Ooh, and chronic that's a big one. disease. And I think, it's, I think that's what we're seeing. And that's why so many people... Well, that's why when I was seeing people fixing their 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 diets, even though they had a horrible looking X-ray, their knee would stop hurting, and we would like, well, you don't need surgery. When did hurt. you start putting that together? Was it like well, a, a single? That page? must have blown your mind. Well, right. it did. It did. And then I kind of started thinking that all these surgeries I've done, I mean, you know, probably fifty percent of the surgeries I've done in my life probably could have been avoided. Wow, you know, it's kind of something you think. Sean, like, I've gotten an argument over because I trained. Uh, I had a I had a wellness personal training facility next to a major hospital and I've gotten an art and I had a lot of clients that were surgeons and doctors so I would train them and then I actually would get in arguments with other doctors sometimes not because I thought I knew better but because I'd have a client that would come in and say oh I have some knee pain doctor says I need you know whatever surgery and we would start doing correctional exercise we start fixing their diet no more pain yet their doctor would still argue that they would need a surgery and I would get in these arguments with them and it was like but they don't hurt anymore. They're moving fine. The x-ray doesn't mean shit if they're okay. Like that, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and a lot of these studies are coming out now showing things like all these meniscectomies, you know, we, we, you know, if somebody comes in with a torn meniscus, a degenerative meniscus in particular, we go in there and trim it up and say, hey, you're going to feel better. The data doesn't support that anymore. I mean, I've done, I did thousands of those procedures. Wow. I mean, it's just like, oh my God, you know, you feel bad about <laughs> that stuff. Damn. But you know, you, you, you do what you, what you know at the time. Sure. You're seeing all these, you know, like some of the rotator cuff surgeries are showing they don't make much difference. And some of the, you know, obviously the spine surgeries don't make much difference. We do this stuff all the time continuously just because that's what we know. It's again, that's our hammer and that's what we know how to hit things with. And so, uh, and some people, you know, you'll get a few people will respond, you know, maybe, maybe 20% of the people go, oh, yeah, I feel better. That's enough. Okay, good. And then, then, you know, you can extrapolate this to the rest of the population. But, you know, I, you know, I found that, uh, you know, as I just kind of read some of the literature outside of my narrow field, because orthopedics, you know, when I, I'm reviewing some of this stuff and I look back and they, they never even mention nutrition at all. It's like not even, you know, if you come in with a sore knee, it's going to be physical therapy, lose weight, uh, take some anti-inflammatories. Maybe we'll inject your knee with a steroid. If that doesn't work, we might scope your knee. And then finally, if none of that stuff works, you know, maybe we'll replace your knee. You know, that, that, that's sort of the paradigm. At no point do we say, well, let's play with your diet. Let's play with some of these other lifestyle factors. You know, let's get your recovery better. Let's get you sleeping better. That never comes into the equation. And to me, that's a huge part of that. You know, it's like I said, I... I've seen it so many times now, you know, just, just listening to people sending me their stories. You know, I've got this website, meatheels.com, which I encourage people to look at. <laughs> what a great name. Yeah, a good name. And, and we've got all these people with these just tremendous life-changing stories that I could never see by operating on somebody. I, I just would never see that because every aspect of their health, and I think many of these diseases, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, arthritis, autoimmune disease, probably all share a common, you know, common cause in many cases. And so if you don't get to that, what's causing that, you know, you're, you know, this is what I used to, this, this used to reward, this is how I, I used to think in the past. I'd, I'd get somebody to come in, they'd have a, a bad arthritic knee, I'd replace their knee, they would feel better. You know, it would definitely make them feel better. Maybe not 100%, but a lot better generally. If you look at the data on knee replacements, you know, not the orthopedic data, but if you look at the pain literature data, about 53% of the people that have an or, a knee replacement three years out, we'll still have pain. You know, it's because you didn't fix the underlying metabolic issues. But I would see somebody who'd come in there, I'd replace their knee, they'd get a good result, they'd be happy with me. they come back next year for their other knee. And I was like, yeah, they like me. Yeah, yeah, I, I, they like me. They want me to fix their other knee. What I should have been doing is like, why do, why can, how do we prevent you from needing a knee replacement? Right. But that, but that's, so that, that's a change in mentality, particularly for a surgeon. It's just like, I can get somebody better with a surgeon. And I'll operate on them. I'll operate on them ten times if they want, because you know I can fix them. Mm -hmm. But you're not fixing them. You're just putting a, a really expensive band aid on a process. And it's it's you know that's God. what drives our healthcare industry. That's what drives our dollars. That's how I was incentivized. The more surgeries I did, the better I got paid. Was it ultimately making patients better? Maybe maybe there's helping their symptoms a little bit. You you sound so like a, you sound like a those wellness hippie wellness experts of ten years ago who were saying that. <laughs> now being somebody who's coming from 
medicine, an actual doctor talking like that uh, is extremely powerful. Like yeah. set aside the carnivore diet, set aside that for a second. What you're saying right now is so powerful because of your background, because you have the training and because you worked in that field. And I can only, and I can only, and it, because you're so powerful, that is extremely threatening to uh, the establishment, if you will. I hate using that word because it sounds like this Illuminati thing, but I'm talking about the medical establishment. The backlash must be crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a message that, that people want to hear that, that depend on their living doing this stuff, because we do. And I mean, this, this is healthcare, unfortunately, has set itself up where if you do not have sick people, the healthcare companies fail. You have to have sick people to make this work and you, you you can't make a profit or can't keep the lights on you can't afford employee empl- pay your employees unless you have a steady stream of sick people and you know there's there's no incentive to, to stop that from going on from that end and so they're not going to you know i know chris Kresser talks about this too is, is how we can change medicine you know we have you know we train armies of of, of paramedical p- people you know the radiology techs their lab techs their cna nursing assistants all these people were training uh, to take care of sick people when we should be training an army of prevention specialists. I mean, that's yeah. what, what I think yeah. should happen. And, you know, some of the folks in the fitness industry, you know, they get that, you know, it's, you know, and, and the social media. So I talked to Mark, when I was Mark Pell's podcast, mm-hmm. I said, look, Mark, you got a big, you got a big loudspeaker. You can use this to do good. Uh, besides selling slingshots and all this, you we're know, just as that. fucking guilty on our side, though. Well, but I mean, that's the thing, you yeah. know, you know, you guys can, you know, once you guys have a big audience, you can say, look, you know, we can we can make people healthier. It's not going to come from the government. You know, there's too many conflicts of interest. There's there's all these business inferences. It's going to take forever for that stuff to, to cycle through. And so, if you've got loved ones, uh, people you care about in your life, you know, you just don't have time to wait for this stuff. And so, you know, I think you have to use like stuff like I'm doing on social media, like what you guys are doing, what some of these other people are doing. And you know, it's kind of funny because I you know, three years ago I thought social media was stupid. I mean, I was like, I don't want to be on fucking Facebook. You know, it's people whining and bitching, complaining and trolling, and I don't want to be part of that stuff. And there's still that that stuff is still there. Obviously, you know, you got these idiots on there that you know just doing That's stupid stuff. Do. Yeah, I don't know. What, what, get a job or something. You know, do something. <laughs> yeah. you know be I mean? productive. Go ahead. But I mean, at the same time, this is where people are listening. You know, they're listening to podcasts. They're, they're checking out Instagram. They're checking out. Snapchat or whatever, you know, I'm learning about that stuff now. But, <laughs> but I mean, this is where people are getting their information from. And so the people that are going sort of outside the main channels are going to have a bigger impact. You know, it's not, people aren't waiting for a Harvard study to tell them what to eat or how to live their life because half the time it's not going to get read. You know, no, no, no one knows how to read those studies. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's boring, you know, and so. And it takes a long time. Like, it, it takes a long time for them to come out and be like, oh, it looks like saturated fat may not be, yeah. you know, after yeah. decades of 30 years, yeah. damage yeah. Yeah. of Dude, severe oxygen damage. Oxygen Magazine has sure. more impact on a lot of people. It just, I mean, incredible amounts of damage that we've caused because of uh, government, you know, centralized, uh, you know, uh, not just power, but, um, you know, when they put out a plan, like, okay, this is what everybody needs to do. This is what we think was it, Dr. Ansel's keys that came out with that sure. hypothesis, which is completely fault, flawed and bullshit, was obviously... Uh, you know, used politically, and um, and we've have terrible, terrible health, and so people just don't trust that stuff anymore. You well, know? I mean, you know, and I, I think Joe Rogan talked about this in the show. You know, the, the sugar industry, you know, paying to suppress data and, and corrupting and trying to point the sugar at, at saturated fat, and, and the vegan doctors are still running that same propaganda. You know, it's it's veganism, in, in my view, is just a sort of a a uh, sort of a the underlings for the processed food industry in a lot of cases, because most of the vegans are eating all this processed product because they have to, because oh. they can't stand. Who wants to sit there and eat kale and, and carrots all day long? You know, I mean, no, and, and a few beans. I mean, they, they end up gravitating towards this, the fake desserts and the, and the fake meats and stuff like that. Some of the most processed food is vegan. You go right, to the store right. and you look at the, in the section with the, the, the fake bacon and burger and look at the ingredients on those, on those things. And it's like a like hundred ingredients to right. make that thing taste like. And the reason they're in the store is because people are eating them. You know, it's not like all the vegans say, well, I never eat that stuff. Well, who's eating them? They're yeah, in the yeah. store. Somebody's eating them. Why, <laughs> why do we exist, have 25 otherwise. aisles of garbage yeah. you know, in the grocery store? It's because people eat that crap. That's right. why it's there. It's yeah. not because it's sitting there, you know, no one's eating it. So the reason it's there 
is people are eating that and the processed food industry knows that. So they're like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, eat your vegan processed food. We're gonna make it cheap and we're gonna make a good profit over that. And so again, this is, you know, again, I don't, I don't think it's conspiracy theory. I think it's just business. Yeah. I mean, well, that's the, business, the consumers wanting it, right? We're right. paying for it. We keep sure. asking for it. That's the question is, would, would anyone do otherwise? I would be curious if, if the people that came in for surgery, how many people would opt out of it if they knew that they had to go change their diet and do a bunch of things? Some too. people would just want the surgery. Right. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. There are some people that just want the easy road. I mean, there's no doubt about that. There's people, I mean, I had, I, I used to have, I, I, I would have women in my office crying because I wouldn't give them an injection because I said, we need to fix your diet. I mean, they would get so mad. I, right. These are the few times I ever got like a negative complaint from patients. He's like, Dr. Baker's so mean, he wants me to lose weight. He wants me to go on a diet and he won't, he won't give me a cortisone injection, which, by the way, probably doesn't help very much in the long run. Oh, anyway, de mm. deteriorate so, your joints. So, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So I would have these people that were just, they were they literally, they're like, you're, you know, I want to see another provider because they'll, they'll, give me my, they'll give me one. I touch, want one. touch on that a little bit and what you know, because I've had a lot of clients that would opt to rather do that than put yeah. in the work. And I got to constantly tell them, like, let's, we got to fix the root cause. You keep getting that, you just banding So talk a little bit about that yeah i mean the, you know like i said again it's a it's a band-aid you know like particularly cortisone injections i would i personally i would almost never want to do that in, unless it was a desperate situation for for me at the, and, and i've given thousands of cortisone injections over the years and at this point i'm like you know you, even the orthopedic literature now doesn't really support it as being very efficacious you know long term it's just you know you might tamp down inflammation for you know a couple of weeks a few months at best but the long-term results of that tend to make you know, the outcome worse. And so, you know, if you want to look at the best interest in somebody, don't do that, you know, fix, again, food, fix the root cause. Again, modify the light factors, the diet, the exercise, the sleep, the recovery, the stress, all those things are going to have a far greater impact on their overall health and the health of that particular joint, you know, you know, it, you know, strengthen the joint. You know, that's the thing, you know, a weak joint is never a healthy joint. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like no one ever got better by getting weaker. Right. You know, that's why, you know, people are like, people are like, well, I can't, I can't deadlift because I have back pain. I'm like, eh, you know, you can, you can learn how to do that or do some heavy kettlebell, kettlebell swings or something. You can strengthen your back and you're going to make it better regardless of what situation you're in. Oh, we think for sure, like uh, up until recently or more or now, um, the recommendation for exercise was, uh, you know, 30 minutes of vigorous cardiovascular yeah. activity which uh, is horrible, horrible advice. Not that 30 minutes of vigorous cardiovascular activity is not good for you, but that's the wrong activity we should, we're should we promoting. What we should be telling people, especially the aging population, is strength training because mm -hmm. that the only form of exercise that directly combats all of the things that happen with age from you know loss of mobility, loss of strength, hormone changes and declines, metabolic you know disease where the metabolism slows down, osteoporosis. I mean osteopenia, osteoporosis, all are directly combated from resistance training, and no other form of exercise does that. But no doctors recommending resistance training. It's all vigorous cardiovascular activity. In fact, they're telling people to not lift weights. Yeah, I mean that's. I mean that, again, and, and this is some of this uh, CYA uh, anti lawsuit stuff because if you tell somebody right. to go go deadlift and they hurt their back, you, you know, potentially you're, you're, you're liable for it. So the, a lot of the advice, again, don't go to your doctor for nutrition and health advice. You're not going to get any. You're going to get shitty advice <laughs> coming <laughs> from a, a coming from a doctor. <laughs> by they the don't way. know what the fuck yeah. they're talking about. I mean, doctors are they? They don't know anything more than your plumber. For 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 weightlifting, you know, I mean, you know, in general, I, I mean, know I trained wow. them. They didn't know anything about. It. I yeah, had to train but them. I mean, I you know, like I said, it's uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, the strength training is important. We're starting to see, you know, it was the advice mostly is go walk, you know, just go, just go, you know, add add a few more. Do do you do your ten thousand steps? You know, get your Fitbit on and do your ten thousand. steps. That's bullshit advice. I mean that. You know, it's going to help, you know. It'll help more than nothing. It'll help more than nothing, yeah. you know, but it's not going to do much. You know, you, like I said, I, I I, believe in balance and moderation is, is basically a fairy tale. I mean, I, I just think you've got to do a meaningful, you have to have a meaningful impact to make an impact. And so this stuff of don't over, don't do anything much, just moderate everything. It doesn't help very much. You've got you've got to really make an effort, and you you know you have to. I mean, it doesn't mean you you, you have to progress. I mean, you don't have to start. You know, doing, you to be appropriate. You, you don't have to start doing snatches and box jumps and running sprints and you know the, the crazy stuff I'm doing. You know, I'm doing stuff because I've been doing this for 40 years. But I mean, you've got to you know set down the gauntlet and say you got to progress. I mean, you can't you can't be weak and expect to age you know appropriately. You're you're going to be you know. You're going to be the lady in the in the in the in the grocery cart on in the uh, in the scooter. I mean, that's what's going to happen, and you're going to need somebody to carry your grocery bags out to the store. 
you know, right. out to the car, which is uh, you know not where you need to be. Mm. Yeah. Does your family eat like you then? Or are you the only one that's pure meat? I'm the only one that's pure meat. Uh, they all love meat, though. I mean, my, so my girlfriend, you know, she's, it's kind of funny. I met my girlfriend five years ago, and she's from France. When I started dating her, she said she was a vegetarian. I'm like, how the fuck can you be a vegetarian and be from France? <laughs> like, this makes no sense. But she, and she was having this awful GI issues and couldn't figure out what to eat. And been to all these, you know, naturopathic doctors, and they're telling her all this stuff. And, you know, as I kind of came through it, I said, look, just start eating a little more meat. You know, and so she's, she's doing this now. Now she eats probably you know, 80% of her diet is meat and that she includes some fruits and vegetables that she likes and, 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 and is doing pretty well with that. And she's much happier and probably her health is the best it's been ever. And my kids, you know, I'm divorced, so I have kids, my kids have time. So I don't mm-hmm. get, to, I can't dictate their whole diet, but I, you know, what I do is I make a bunch of meat and I, and I, and my kids love it and they want to eat it. And, and this is a sad thing is because I make a nice steak and those, the, my daughters particularly, my, my, my seven and 10 year old daughter, they know where the best piece of that steak's going to be. And they always say, Hey dad, I want this piece. So, <laughs> it's so, so I'm giving them, uh, you know, I'm giving away my best cuts of steak to those girls, but <laughs> you know, and then if they're still hungry, you know, they'll, they'll get whatever, they'll get a piece of fruit or they'll get, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. They don't usually ask for vegetables. Mm-hmm. I don't think any kid in <laughs> Maybe some weird kids do, but most people, <laughs> most kids, you know, they'll, you know, give me a piece of fruit, you know, maybe a little yogurt or something like that, or a piece of dark chocolate, you know, kind of the ketogenic type stuff. Mm-hmm. That's how they tend to eat, you know, and I'm, but there's days where they, they'll only eat meat. They're like, Dad, we yeah. want to yeah. do you, and I have no problem with On that. On those uh, forums that you talked about with these people doing the carnivore diet, right. have you noticed um, anybody saying, like, after a certain amount of time, like, just sticking with meat, that it, it was a challenge, like, just as far as, like, you know, not having variety and, and not having a different flavor to kind of introduce. Yeah, that's that's typically more early on than later, quite honestly. You know, most people, you know, they get excited. You know, here's the thing. You know, I, I you know, I, I don't expect the whole world to go carnivore. I mean, no one's going to do it. No, the whole world's never going to do any diet. I mean, mm-hmm. we're all going to have variety. Uh, you know, there are certain people, like particularly young guys right now, they're doing it to be cool. Hey, I'm a carnivore. I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a beast, you know, whatever. <laughs> they're, they're doing it just to be cool right now. So some guys are doing that. There's a significant population that literally do have some health issues. And so what they're finding is, you know, they got to transition. They got to use, use to not running on carbohydrates. You know, they eat, you know, for the first week or two, they're, they're like, this is cool. I'm eating steak every day. And then they start to get a little bit bored with this stuff. You know, there's people like, yeah, you know, I need a little more variety. Uh, you know, so what I, and a lot of times they under eat. They tend to, because it's so satiating, they find their energy's low. Mm. And because meat is, it's really hard to eat. You know, you know, if, if I tell somebody to eat two pounds of meat, that's a challenge for most people. For me, oh. it's a snack now. I can just yeah. crush that. Oh, you get no palate problem. fatigue really quickly, right. I'm sure. But, 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 you know, you, you, you find that it, it's a little hard, but, I, you know, the people that do it a long time, that make it past the first two or three months, those are the ones that find that now all of a sudden all they want is steak. That, that, that sort of variety goes away from them because they find that I just really crave this nutrition. And, and, I, and literally, I'm like my dogs now. You know, when I feed my dogs, I feed my dogs meat. You know, every day they get the same damn meal. I don't give them a menu. And they're happy as can be. They're dancing. They're jumping. They're, they're, they're drooling all over the place. Their tails are wagging. That's literally how I am when I'm cooking my steak. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm drooling. I'm sitting here. I can't wait to eat this. You know, half the time I'm talking to people on Instagram while I'm cooking this stuff. While I'm sitting here drooling. I'm drooling thinking about it right now because I haven't eaten breakfast. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so, but what I tell people initially is, you know, make make as much variety as you can do it. You know, put bacon and eggs and a little bit of cheese on there. Put a little spices on there. Rotate your meats. Get some seafood. Get some chicken. Change it, change it, change it for a while just to get you through that period of time because it's usually the first month or two where people have this variety issue. And then the people that, that, that sort of do this, then they find out that, man, I just really want meat. I just want, I want steak. Steak, I think, you know, let's look at, Again, back to evolution. I'm, I'm just thinking, what do we hunt? What could we have hunted back then? Um, it's probably easier to kill a big, slow-moving ruminant animal with a spear, because that's what we had, than it is to kill a bird. I mean, how hard is it to throw a spear at a bear bird and, and eat chicken? So that's why I think a lot of people will find it. Things like poultry. Again, poultry is not as nutritious in my view. I mean, if you look at the data, you know, in the U.S., we started, we've over the last, since about the 1970s, our beef consumption has dropped about 30 to 40 percent. <laughs> And our chicken consumption has gone up to match that. So we're eating about the same amount of meat, but it's, it's went from mostly meat to mostly chicken. And, you know, you can, you know. That's probably a response to the whole low fat thing. Yeah, right. Because exactly exactly. no, you get these boneless, skinless chicken breasts that, right. that, that taste like garbage, you know, but, but you got to eat them <laughs> because they're good for you. They're healthy. And you're going to be low fat. But I think that, you know, and again, as the red meat consumption has fallen, our obesity rates and our diabetes rates, have, mm. diabetes rates have gone up. So I'm like, you know, for the people that say red meat is causing obesity and diabetes I'm like well, that doesn't really match up you know and you know so 
Um, Red but, meat's more it's more nutrient it's, dense. It's more nutrient yeah. dense. It is more and I will tell you as somebody that only eats meat, it's more satiating. There's no doubt about it. You know, if 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 you if you give me a hundred pieces of meat in front of me, I'm gonna pick a ribeye steak ninety nine mm-hmm. times out of a hundred because mm-hmm. I know it's got enough fat. And it's, you know, the flavor's good, and it's just very, very nourishing. And it, I think it's, it is. It's nutrient-dense. I mean, it's got all that heme iron. It's got all that protein. It's got all that creatine in there. Uh, it's got all the carnison in there. All these, you know, it's kind of funny. The supplements that seem to work, the ones most that come of them from come from meat, meat you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, other than steroids, you know, but I mean, you think about it. You're right, creatine, creatine, creatine and melanin, yeah, carnosine, you know, nitrates are in meat. You know, they, 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 it was funny because nitrates, nitrates used to be evil, right, until they found that it worked in beet juice. No, yeah, nitrates are okay. But nitric nit- oxide. Well, that yeah, kind of. Nitri- you know, so it's like all the stuff that actually works is just found in meat, like collagen supplementation. Just eat a freaking steak, you know? Yeah, it's that kind of answers my other question though as far as the expensive side like you, you look at like eating steaks all the time that sounds like really expensive but then if you're somebody that's supplementing with all these other products that cost you know x amount of money uh but like how do you how do you like suggest like do you actually go like buy an actual um a full cow or like do you, do you, do you have like a huge freezer for all this stuff yeah i don't have a huge enough freezer you know but i will buy in bulk you know and i'll find out when it's when it's a good value and i'll just load up i'll buy 50 pounds I'll call the butcher up and say hey you, you got ribeyes for five bucks a pound cut me 50 pounds of that stuff and i'll and i'll and they love it man i tell because i tell the butchers about this carnivore stuff and they love it man those guys are like yeah that's cool <laughs> oh, my best friend yeah, yeah, yeah you know but, best customer right but there. uh you know it, it you know Ultimately, I spend less money on this, you know, and, and than I would if I was eating a, a, a diet of organic fruits and vegetables and hmm. all this other, you know, processed stuff and the supplements that would, would need to come with it in a lot of cases. Uh, so ultimately, my diet is cheaper, you know. And, I, and again, I I'm atypical because I'm a I'm eating four pounds of meat today, and it's mostly ribeye, which is more expensive than a lot of people can do. A lot of people do this on ground beef, and they eat two pounds a day. And so you can you can you can make it happen on five six bucks a day, which is you know, it's a cup of coffee at Starbucks in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. I think. And so there are a lot of people, you know, and again, there's an argument, you know, do we have to have grass finished, you know, all this this stuff? And I'll make the argument that there is not a lot of data that, that shows there's a huge nutritional difference on that when it comes to human health. I mean, I can tell you from people that I've seen observing it from what I've seen myself, it doesn't make a difference in human health for most people. There may be a few people who say, I feel better on grass-fed meat, but most people say, I can tell no difference or even the opposite. And if you look at, you know, let's talk about hormones. And a lot of people, well, there's hormones added to these beef, okay? An animal naturally produces hormones anyway. So even if you're eating grass-finished, hormone, quote-unquote, hormone-free beef, you're still eating hormones. You know, it's just the animal producing them themselves. And the stuff they give those animals, they give them testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and, and two other uh, synthetic ones. But the animals display that stuff anyway. And so if you compare that, uh, the amounts are when you, when you implant the animals, the amounts go from a few nanograms, like six nanograms to nine nanograms, which is infinitesimally small amounts, right? If you compare that to what you produce endogenously in your own body, what you would get from eating an egg, what you would get mm-hmm. from eating dairy, what you would get, you know, if it were milk to, is the one that you'd have to be careful for with hormones. Yeah, mil- that and, one can and, have higher and, amounts. And then, and then, uh, uh, Organ meats. Mm-hmm. Organ meats have a higher hormone mm-hmm. amount. So if you're going to say, I need to eat liver and I need to eat dairy, it's way more yeah. than you're going to get from a, even yeah. a grain-finished, hormone-implanted piece of beef. Yeah. I would uh, go organic just to avoid the glyphosates and shit that are in the, you know, the, 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 the food, the grass that they may eat or the, the, you know, the plant that they may eat. Yeah, I think cows in particular are pretty good at, at detoxifying that stuff. And that's a, that's a, but, you know, that's, that, that may be, may be an argument. I think the biggest argument for pre- pre- preferencing uh, grass-fed or grass-finished animals versus the traditional sort of animals. Because most it, it, people don't understand this, but cows, whether they're finished on, on corn or grain, are spending 80% of their life on pasture anyway. Mm-hmm. That's how they start. You know, if you go up to Harris Ranch, you know, I guess south of here, 80% of their life is spent on, on on in pasture. So they're pastured anyway. They spend that last, you know, three, four months fattening up on grains. And so it's not like they're never on grass, you know. And so that's, you know, when we talk about environmental impact. The other thing is, you know, if we want to talk about environmental impact, because this is a big topic, you know, people, well, how do you, this isn't sustainable. You know, regardless of how you finish the animal, you know, how you pasture them their whole life is really important. And so if we decide we want to do this, if we, if people decide that, hey, meat is not the bad guy, meat is actually health food, which I think it is. I think it's one of the healthiest foods on the planet. If we start saying, well, wait a minute, if meat's healthy, we need to, we need to get more people to eat it. How do we, how do we make that happen? 
you know, the U.S. is pretty efficient. We, you know, our carbon footprint's the lowest in, in, in the whole world. I mean, we've got very good efficiency practices through selective breeding. We, we've got animals that make more meat for less feed, for less time. Uh, but I think the stuff like Alan Savory's talking about, Joel Salatin, you know, how do we, how do we graze the animals properly, rotating the pastures, and then we can actually, you know, if the calculations are correct, you know, with the soil regeneration and the soil, putting the carbon and methane back into the soil, that could actually bring down the greenhouse gases, you know, with animals uh, managed properly. So it could be, again, if the will were there, the technology is there, we know how to do that. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of having the will to do that. Uh, We could actually make it to where uh, eating meat would be both environmentally sustainable, but a a net positive for the environment. I I agree completely. It's and when it comes to feeding the world, uh, it's not a food production problem at all. Nobody will, no economist will say it's a food production problem. It's a food distribution problem which can only be solved through markets. You know, let markets figure this out and make it more efficient, so. Well, if you look at like, you know, uh, you know, if you look at Southeast Asia and Africa, how they, how they manage their, 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 their cattle, it's, 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 it's very inefficient. It's, it, that's where the problems tend to be in many cases. But, you know, you compare it to people that say, I'm eating a vegan vi- diet, it's environmentally friendly. Well, you got your grapes from Venezuela and you got your yeah. oranges from Australia. You know, it, it, you've, how much transportation costs to bring all that food non-seasonal? 100%, right. Yeah. Yeah, how much does that impact the environment? It's very so, true. I think what it is is this, is that when... When you look at diets in general and how people eat, and yes, there is a, you have to agree, right? I'm sure you wouldn't disagree with me. There's a massive individual variance, right? Some people do well on some things and others don't. And there are general truths, but the individuals themselves can be quite, quite, uh, quite different in terms of how they respond to these types of things. But, you know, when you look at, um, when you look at diets, only one type of diet has a moral, ethical, religious fervor behind it. And that's veganism. And I, I've always said this, if this is how you want to eat, I totally support it. But there is no other diet where somebody eats it because they believe not eating that way is immoral and killing or, or murder. Whereas vegans believe, many vegans, not all, but at least the most consistent ones. Because if you look at the literature, vegans who eat, who eat that way because they think it's healthy don't stay vegan very long, or at least they go on and off all the time. They cheat quite a bit. In fact, I read an interesting study where um, vegans who, when they drink alcohol, tend to eat a, you know meat right. after drinking alcohol because their inhibitions are down. But vegans who are vegans because of the moral, ethical, you know, in quotes, religious aspect of it, where they believe firmly that killing animals is murder, they tend to be extremely consistent. And I think because, I mean, if I thought every time I ate something, I was killing, like I was murdering something, you better believe I would, if I believe that strongly about it, I would use everything at my disposal to make my case, everything, the environment, it's better for the environment. I would say, you know, of course it's immoral. I would say, uh, you know, I would make crazy claims about, uh, you know, the health and how, how, how much better it is for you and how much worse it is. And I would make documentaries showing the plight of these animals and I would go to schools and teach. And so that's, uh, that's, I think where a lot of that comes from. I think a lot of that information and of course food manufacturers who, uh, you know, cause it's a billion, billion dollar industry, they're going to grab onto that because now you've got this group of people who are going to preach, you know, selling your stuff because they believe so wholeheartedly that eating an animal is murder. I think that's where a lot of that information comes from. Like people who eat lots of meat don't do it re- with that same type of fervor. It's not like, again, you're not eating it to save, you're not eating meat to save plants. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, when I, cause I've, I've gotten, I used to start to, I used to debate with the vegans and I just, now I just block them cause I just don't want to deal with that <laughs> stuff. silly. But I would say, you know, this is my question. I said, if your health was bad and the only way you could improve it by, was by eating meat, would you do that? No. And they would all say no. And I, I would it's say- It's a different, it's a whole different system. I would just say then, then, you, not logical. then you're not logical. It's like converting right? someone's sense. religion. You can't yeah. do it. Yeah, I was just like, okay, if you want to sacrifice yourself, that's fine, but don't expect me to do that. Don't expect everyone else to do that stuff. And so- but yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I've talked to some people that know some of these people. That the, 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 I was talking with Vinnie Tordrich, and he said he had a, a relatively famous vegan on it. He goes, hey, man, I won't say the guy's name, but he said, hey, man, why are you guys sort of letting out some of this misinformation? And the guy was like, it's for the greater good. I mean, it's just... Yeah, of course. It's just for the greater good. You know? <laughs> it totally sounds we're, like a religion we, right we there. Don't, we don't... We, we, the means justify the... You know, the ends justify the means. You know? Hey, man, if people were eating, you know, humans, I would... You better believe I would say everything to get them to stop eating humans. And a lot of vegans, they, they, they make it parallel. Like, animals are like people. And I saw a display once where 
there were there were people making a protest and they were they had shrink wrapped themselves yeah. and they were naked lying on the floor <laughs> and they were Spain, like yeah. like they were meat like with a label on them and you know it's because they and look here's the deal like if you have that kind of you know if if you really love animals and you're doing it in a way that in, in your you know for your beliefs and you're not lying like all power to you but a lot of this information is coming from that side and a lot of it's just not true now i'm not supporting i'm not saying be eating all meat is the best uh, either so i'm not saying that either and i know you're a big supporter of that sean uh but i do enjoy what you're saying about uh you know in support of it and i don't hear you saying this is the way everybody should eat whereas i hear that from other people in other diets this is the way everybody should eat in fact i don't want everybody to eat that because it'll drive the price up too much <laughs> yes <Yeah, that's laughs> right like, it's hard for me to do that. no but I, I you know i i you know like i said i truly am doing this because i want people to to find an option to help their health care their, their health issues because you know there's people that have i mean literally horrible horrible diseases that you know they go to the doctors for 10 15 years going from drug to drug to specialist to specialist and they're, they're, I mean, they're depressed, they're miserable, they're, and, and they're literally able to change their life around doing this stuff. And I think this is a very powerful tool. Um, you know, there, here's what I, you know, people ask me about genetic diversity. You know, how do people tolerate different diets? Well, we know, again, I'll, I'll use the evolutionary argument back, you know, three million years ago, we've been eating meat. So I think most of us tolerate meat pretty well for the most part. Can you tolerate other things? That becomes a question. Can you tolerate certain wheats? Can you tolerate dairy? I mean, mm-hmm. that probably, because those things were introduced into our diet 10, you know, 10, 15,000 years ago. People that grew up in those regions, you know, at least ancestrally, probably have a greater capacity to handle those things. Even some of totally the vegetables, true. some of the vegetables that we that we buy in the grocery store, we, we we know most of the vegetables that we buy in the grocery store today, they didn't exist. I mean, they weren't even they were created over the last several thousand years. So, you know, people were haven't been eating broccoli for fifty thousand years. It's only the last you know even hundreds of years. You're a hundred percent right. If you look at lactose intolerance, they actually they can show you like if you're from the uh, northern European regions, the rate of lactose intolerance is extremely low when you compare it to uh, the Mediterranean or some Asian cultures or some African cultures minus maybe the Maasai people where lactose intolerance is like 70 to 80 percent. Meanwhile, you go up to Northern Europe and 95 percent of the people can tolerate dairy, no problem. Which part of the world was eat, was you know using dairy and making it a staple in their diet uh, first, well, it was the Northern Europeans. Yeah, so I mean, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I got back from Iceland, and they're they're you know the skier and all the, the the Icelandic yogurt and stuff like that. They, you know, th- this is funny because I went to Iceland, and you know, Iceland's only got about three hundred and you know, they got about three hundred fifty thousand people there. Not a big country, uh, but you know, look what they've produced. You know, from an athletic standpoint, they've got you know eight worlds world strongest man titles. Oh, you know, they're massive. I mean, you know, you got uh, was it Magnus for Magnuson and. Uh, uh, John Paul Sigmar. Yeah, there you know, go. those guys are the guys who won though, and then they've got how many CrossFit athletes have won mm-hmm. CrossFit titles? Tiny, tiny country. What is their historical diet? I mean, it's it's lamb, it's seafood, it's dairy, and they have very little fruits and vegetables and a little bit of grain. They got a little bit of grain, some rye bread that they had to import from Denmark. And so when I'm talking to these people right now, so Iceland has three hundred thousand people ish. They've got a thousand people trying this carnivore diet. Oh wow! I mean, that's a huge. That's a big that's percentage. A, that's a big percentage. You know, compared yeah. to the U.S., mm-hmm. where we maybe have twenty, thirty thousand people who are doing it right now, uh, and only because I'm, you know, getting out there and being crazy. It's all your it. fault. Well, <laughs> some of it is, but I mean, so they've got a huge percentage of people doing it, but they get it because they look. I live on this friggin' frozen island. It makes sense to me from a from an evolution, you know, just a historical standpoint. You know, I I just don't have access to this stuff. They've got a big vegan population in Iceland now. They've got like twenty thousand people in their group or. Maybe it wasn't twenty thousand. Maybe it's five thousand. But you know, because they're 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 getting this Western influence from from the mm-hmm. rest of it. But the people that are like, yeah, my grandfather, he pretty much only ate animal products, and he lived to hundred. They have you know, not only are they big, beastly, strong people, kick ass athletes, they have more hundred year old men oh, wow. than anywhere really? else on the planet uh, per capita. You know, there's more Icelandic Cincinnati. Blue zone? I did not it's know not that. It's, it's not a blue zone. It's not a blue zone. It's not. I don't know how they determine these blue zones. That's another thing that I can certainly talk on that stuff. But Iceland is a healthy, healthy country. I did not I mean, know that because yeah, I, I, I am familiar either. with like touch on the, the island blue. of Sardinia, yeah, Okinawa, touch on the blue zones. you know, all these other places where they have a high amount of, you know, centurions. Um, but I did not know about Iceland. Yeah, Iceland is, I mean, it's not considered a technically a blue zone. You know, you can look at Hong Kong. You know, this is another one, another place. Hong Kong, if you look at the life, life, uh, you know, life longevity statistics. Hong Kong is like number one or number two in the world mm-hmm. right now. 
Uh, and there's seven million people. It's not like some little like Loma Linda where they've got right. a few, few, you know, fifty thousand people. The Seventh Day Adventists, right? Yeah, but I mean, so they've got a huge population. They're living longer than anybody else, and they put away the meat there. I mean, they make they they put the U.S. to shame on on their red meat consumption and their pork consumption. Hmm. I mean, they eat a ton of meat and they're living a ton, really, really long time. So I don't know who decided who are the, how these blue zones were were picked out. You know, it's kind of like. Uh, the other thing is, so Okinawa is considered a blue zone, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, and the, the vegans love to point this this one out. They say, well, Okinawa, they lived a long time. They ate a you know a lot of process, you know a lot of carbohydrate, a lot of rice. They also eat you know they also eat pork and, and seafood and stuff like that. But one of the things they did a study on the Okinawans that lived over a hundred. The only ones that lived over a hundred were not vegetarians. There were oh, no shit. vegetarians that lived over a hundred. Only ones that lived over a hundred was ones that included meat in their diet. You know, if you look at the, you know, because they, they love to tout the the Seventh Day Adventist study, because they've got, you know, sure. who are the Seventh Day Adventists? You know, they're they're, they're you know they're a religious group, uh, you know, basically out of Loma Linda, uh, that has a big vegetarian founding situation back. It's their know, religion. Like, it's like Literally. to the eighteen hundreds, and so they they don't smoke, they don't drink, uh, they don't. I don't think they drink caffeine. They exercise. They exercise. It's part their of their religion. Body is a temple. That's a religion. That is why they live long. It's not the <laughs> veganism. And so when they look at this study, they like to quote that study. The ones that live the longest in that group are the ones that actually include fish in their diet. So when they include animal, <laughs> di- when they add animal food back, and they live even longer. And then if you compare that to that's fascinating another similar religious group like the Mormons, the Mormons live just as long, but they're meat eaters. And so you know when we talk about what Im- what actually impacts longevity, really diet is has a, has a role, but it's not a huge role. If you go, if you live in a rich country that has good access to health care and favorable climate, certain ge- geographic latitudes, you live longer. It's not, you know, that's why Sweden and Monaco and France and uh, uh, Switzerland and places like that have some of the highest longevities in the world. It's because they're wealthy countries and diet had, and, and they eat a ton of meat there. Those places eat tons of meat. It's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's not the veganism. You look at India, India, pa- Bangladesh, Pakistan. They are the most vegetarian countries in the world. Their life in sex to see is like 68, you know. Uh, you know, but poverty plays a role in that as well. I mean, it's, you know, there's some impoverished places. And this is the thing that people like to point out. Well, the Maasai or the uh, Inuit didn't live as long. You know, their, their life expectancy is 60s or 70s compared to people living in other parts of Canada. Again, socioeconomic status is the biggest driver of longevity. So if you compare like the, the, uh, the Inuit compared to somebody equally – uh, impoverished because these people are living on the fringes. Oh, they're, yeah. they're living up in the free, in the frozen. If you live to your seventy and you're living in harsh condi- yeah, in those conditions, I mean, they're, and they're, they're, they have no, you know, very little access to health care. Yeah. If you compare that to somebody like in Africa, you know, Central Africa or something like that, that has similar living conditions, they outlive them by quite a bit. You know, so it's 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 you know because they always like to point out well they didn't live as long. The same thing with saying you know prehistoric man they didn't live they, they lived to twenty five. That's a lot of that doesn't take into account, you know, uh, infant mortality rates. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, right. if you know, they were they they found, by a dinosaur. the average of it. <laughs> yeah, but makes no, but I mean, they, they have actually <laughs> they've actually found fossil records of people that they think are 50, 60, 60 years old living in the prehistoric times, and that presupposes. So the way we date skeletal skeletal remains, right? You can date kids pretty well. When I look at an X-ray, I can look at an X-ray of a kid's hand, and I can say, "Oh, that kid's about four or five years old." And mm-hmm. I, I'm usually accurate within a few months or a year at least. Once you reach skeletal maturity, say 25 when your clavicle ossifies, it becomes harder to date that. So you have to look at wear and tear things. Sometimes they look at uh, rates of uh, cartilage uh, ossification in the ribs. But that presupposes people age the same way that we do now. And we know it. And the same thing with the dental. That's interesting. So what they're doing is they're taking like, you know, they're taking some guy from 1850 and they say they know this guy lived to 62 and this is what his bones look like. And so they're saying, well... Uh, this is what a guy who lived 20,000 years ago's bones should look like. When that doesn't hold up, and even the guys that do this, they say there's a big issue with that. So we don't even know for sure if those adult skeletons that look young and healthy, maybe they weren't 25, maybe they were 55. But yeah, they didn't, maybe they were but, 70, they just looked but, awesome, But right? they didn't get all this disease process from eating mm. all the wheat and all the all the other stuff that we And, were and they were active as hell. Yeah, exactly. And they yeah, were active so, as yeah. hell. So, I mean, it's... it's, it's That's fascinating. A lot, of the, a lot of the dogma that we have out there, a lot of our nutritional uh, truths are based on really shaky stuff. And so I think it's, you know, I think to me, it's like, to me, I say, you know, that's why I say, well, let's just, let's just run the clock back and say, let's assume humans are basically carnivorous animals, which we are. I think there's no doubt about it. And and then let's, let's put nutrition in that frame. And, and did we eat berries from time to time? Did we find some stuff? Sure we did. 
what's the net impact of that for many people it's, it's good it's net it's negative it's, i mean there's no negative to that for some people it's an issue depending on what plant there is you know we can't eat 98 5 98.5 5 percent of the plants on earth we cannot eat it doesn't make it a good doesn't make a very good argument that we're herbivores which the vegans try to do which i think is just insane you know <laughs> You know, why would you be an herbivore when you can't eat most of these plants on the on the planet when you can eat every single animal? So if you so if you know you can you can look at some of these things about protein. You know, this is another thing. You get too much protein, it's gonna it's gonna destroy your kidneys. We've got so many research studies coming out here. Jose Antonio, I don't mm. know if you're familiar with his work, mm-hmm. ran a bunch of uh, resistance trains guys, and he fed them. It was like four grams per pound. You know, of, of protein. Wow. No, no issue with kidney issues. It was a short. It was a short term, sh- shorter yeah. term study. But you know, I, I, I think he had com- a year. I think it was out a year. I think I think he had another follow up up to two years. Yeah. Now, now, here's the deal though with protein is that uh, you know supplement companies will push incredible amounts of protein through supplementation. I think if you're just eating meat, you're probably not going to consume more than. Because I'm telling you right yeah, now. Yeah, good luck eating four grams per pound of body weight it, all food. steak. That would be tough. Yeah, you'd have it. I do it. You, you'd yeah. have it. <laughs> I do it. You'd have, you're also a massive human being. But you know, I mean, <laughs> sure, some people can get away with it. Sure, some people can get away with it, but it, it, it would be tough for most people. Like a 150-pound female or 130-pound female trying to get, you know, 300 grams of protein a day is going to be, she might have a tough time doing right, it right, from food. I, right. I mean, yeah, like I said, if, if I wanted to eat, you know, 800 grams of protein a day, I couldn't do it during steak. I mean, I could do it with, I could take some whey protein there and mix go. it up, yeah. mix it up in water, and I could do that pretty easily without, but, you know, what is too much protein? How do we determine that? And I think, again, if you're on a diet, you're, you know, a, a, a whole food, natural, human-appropriate diet, you have, you have something called an appetite, right? Right. And there's your you gauge. Know, there's your gauge. And I think I think mm. you know. God, I, like you sound. I, said, I, I love what you're saying. Yeah. No, I think I think we were designed. There was some intelligence that went into our design. And why do we have an appetite? Because you're supposed to eat. You're supposed to hunger. That's why these people that are that are like you got to fast all this time. I'm like, I prefer the term intermittent feasting. You know, I just eat. I crush a bunch of food, and then I eat again when I'm hungry. You know? How long, how does that work out for you? How often? How long do you go without? So, so for me, typically, this is a natural pattern for me. Is I usually, usually eat about twice a day. So I usually might, you know, depending on my workout schedule, um, I might eat a breakfast, work out over the lunch hour, and then eat again. You know, five six o'clock at night, and then not eat again for fourteen sixteen hours. And and that, and that again, you get the benefits of autophagy, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, some people argue it's a different time frame, but I, I would say it probably isn't. Um, but when I'm hungry and I'm only eating one thing, you know, why would my body tell me I'm hungry if I'm, and I'm only, I'm only giving it one thing. So it's telling me I'm hungry because, Hey, dumb, butt, you it's need some energy eat. and right. you need some nutrient, you need some structure. And so for me, it's just, it just makes sense. That's how every other animal in the wild does it. You know, and, and some people will start argue, well, lions don't always, they're not always successful in their hunt when they hunt. Well, yeah, but they're still trying, you know, it's not like they're saying, I'm going to sit here and wait, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. Cause I'm. I got this uh, mm-hmm. intermittent fast I'm doing. I mean, you know, and I would say prehistoric humans are the same thing. I mean, I would say. We probably went without without food for long periods of time just because it was, I don't think you, like eating meat twice a day, you'd have to be a damn good successful hunter and maybe some refrigeration. Well, I mean, again, it depends on where you live. And I think, you know, I think to your point, you know, you got to make your own damn fire and you're a nomad and you're not carrying a kitchen with you. I mean, you I mean, you might, you know, you're probably cooking on rocks and you got to yeah. build your own fire. So they probably, my guess is they probably ate about once a day. Uh, but, you know, if you think about, uh, again, w- one of the problems we u- people use is modern hunter-gatherers gatherer- to approximate what we probably did 20,000 years ago. We don't live in the same world. You know, modern hunter-gatherers are, are on the fringes. They're, 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 they're dealing with the dregs of, the, of what's left. Back then, we had these vast herds of megafauna. We had mammoths that we wiped out with, with impunity. I mean, we just took these mammoths out. You know, you kill a mammoth. Say you're, you're living in a tribe of 20, 30 dudes, and you take down a mammoth. How much meat do you have? And it's, and it's the ice age, and it's cold, and you probably can figure out how to store this stuff. You got stuff. food for a little while there. You got food for a little while, so maybe you only got to kill a mammoth every two months. And so maybe you're not going through all these periods where you're starving. I'd say there's at least periods of time. So you don't do fasting then or, or prolonged fasting? I don't do. I'm not going to go sit there. I'm, I'm working out. I'm not going to sit there and spend three or four days without eating. I mean, I'm just like, what the fuck? I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, I mean, I think- Have you I, seen the science supporting the prolonged well, yeah, fast? Yeah, I mean, I know, some of, the, I know some, of the, some, of the, some of the theory behind that. But again, who's, what population is doing that? Carbohydrate plant eating populations, right? right? It's showing so, huge benefits to these. Well, types. even yeah. Dr. Walter Longo talks. Mm. He's like one of the leading world. Right, sure, yeah. sure. And yeah. he does, 
a uh, fasting mimicking diet, which is, uh, of course, no carbohydrates. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. there's, there's uh, again, all the data that we've seen on animal studies which show calorie restriction leads to longevity, it's all done in animals eating carbohydrates. And so, we don't have a good pure carnivore study showing that. That They've done some dog studies, but what were they feeding the dogs? They're feeding the dogs dog food, you know, which is grains and all that crap. And they show that they, if they ate less grain dog food, they'd live a little longer. But you know, I've not seen, again, this is my thought on this stuff with all this stuff, because it's all theoretical. Until you've got guys walking around at 120 years old that are still jacked, you know, this is all theory. <laughs> right. and so if you put too much faith in that stuff, I mean, it, it, to me, it's just, you know, it's a leap of faith. And, you know, we'll see, you know, like I said, it's the same thing with the chromium piconolate, you know. Yeah, that sounded like a good time at the thing at the time, but then the science went by, and now you're like, so for me, you know, this, I don't care. I don't know when I'm going to die. I mean, I have no idea. I may, I may get hit by a bus tomorrow. Who knows? The vegans will blame it on meat, of course. But, <laughs> uh, you know, but, <laughs> no, serious. But, uh, you know, what I think is, you know, what can I do today to get myself as healthy as possible, and how do I gauge that? Again, what's my libido like, skin like, you know, strength like, capacity like? What's my exercise capacity like? All those things to me, you know, if you're strong and fit in your 30s, you're more likely to be strong and fit in your 40s mm -hmm. than, it, than if you weren't. And so to me, that's just a simple, you know, I have this, you know, try to make things as simple as possible. And some people, it, it makes their head explode because they're like, I got to have everything complicated. I have to have calculators to figure out what to do, how to live, what labs to get, what macros to count, uh, you know. And so I, I'm just like, it's, it's, it can be very simple, you know, pretend you're a stupid animal and, and just get on with your life. Well, yeah. Yeah. well, you make, I mean, uh, I, I appreciate a lot of the stuff you're saying. I don't necessarily, well, it's, see, here's the deal. I, it's not that I disagree with you because you're not necessarily speaking in absolutes, but you make a very compelling case. Mm -hmm. um, and you're talking about, you know, evidence and you're, you're making a lot of sense. And I appreciate it. I really appreciate it because one thing that you said that I agree with a hundred percent is that there needs to be a counter argument. Yes. Whether it's right or wrong, Maybe you're completely wrong. Maybe you're way out there, but there does need to be a, a counter argument because there doesn't exist. There, there isn't one right now. And if you just get one side all the time, you're going to get some mistakes. Well, that's why I always appreciate outliers. You know, I like people challenging like common thought, and so this is what definitely drew you to my attention. And I thought it'd be a good conversation. And of course, you know, the, it, it panned out. So I'm looking forward to seeing what your 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 results look like on Rob Wolf's podcast. Sure, sure. Should... I, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. With them. I'll <laughs> yeah. talk to you with them off air. So, okay, so, okay. But, there you uh, go. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, it's. Uh, uh, you know, this is a thing because, you know, we have some, we have some freaky outliers. You look at the bodybuilder community and stuff like that. And I'm like these, you know, how do you get lean and muscular? Well, ask a fucking bodybuilder. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask a nutritionist, you know, because, you know, or, you know, it's just like, you know, these guys, are, you know, they're, they're pushing the envelope. And sometimes you need to get these guys to push the envelope. You know, somebody had to learn how to fly. You know, somebody had to learn how to build an airplane. So you got to have the guys that are willing to be on the edge. And to be do kind crazy, of the crazy stuff. The crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times it's the athletes because they're like, I just want to perform you know mm -hmm. and so they do what they need to do not that i'm promoting taking a bunch of drugs and stuff like that but sure. i mean uh you know so it's you know it's an outlier yeah i certainly may be wrong i mean certainly at I, the I, end of the day I, you're listening to your body right so right, if your body yeah, told yeah, you sure. to change it yeah i mean like would. here's here's the thing because you know i don't know if you know the guy named mark lobeliner he's a he's a fitness guy bodybuilder guy and he he wants to do the carnivore diet and you know he's like man but i sell whey protein for a living and i'm like <laughs> i'm like you know i'm like well you know, whey protein probably doesn't, you don't need whey protein if you're eating all meat. I don't see a real reason. <laughs> but, got, but dude, man, I'm selling whey protein. So here's what I would do. You know, I would maybe cut down your meat, you know, have some whey protein, include a little extra fat in there so you kind of get at least a normal meat-like ratio. And he's like, oh yeah, cool, that's great. So now he's in there doing that stuff. And so I said, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I've got some whey protein in my house I haven't I haven't used in a year because it's been sitting on my shelf because I'm like, why do I need whey protein when I'm getting 400 grams of protein? A day? <laughs> so I had some of that ate it and i mean like i was like gi distressed and i mm -hmm. woke up in the middle of the night with diarrhea and i'm like fuck the whey protein i don't need that stuff yeah. but i mean you know I'm, I'm you know you know at some point because there's more and more athletes wanting to do this and they're asking me well how can i do a cheat meal how do i sneak in you know because it's the same thing with the ketogenic diet you know and i did all that stuff cyclic mm -hmm. ketogenic diet targeted ketogenic mm -hmm. diet you know the the carb night stuff i did all those things and you know for me I didn't find a big benefit in that stuff. And a lot of times it just made me feel more lethargic. My digestion was an issue. And so I found that it wasn't a net benefit for me. It's not to, make, not to say that you can't do this a lot of different ways. And, you know, maybe you eat carnivore. 
you know, there's some carnivore purists out there, and I deal with these people, and I understand what they're getting at, and they're mostly dealing with sick people, and they got people that don't have discipline, and if they, if they have a bite of a, uh, of, of a you know, stevia, they're going to go crazy, and they're going to end up on a three-month binge eating cupcakes and wreck all their health, and so there's people that, like, we don't want you to do that, but at the same time, you know, because I'm pretty disciplined. I mean, I, I ate a crappy near-vegan diet for six months, you know, and, and, you know like, I'm going to eat this shit because I think I'm making me healthy. And I'm, I'm disciplined enough. You know, as an athlete, you you find it, you know, you do what it takes. Oh, yeah. You sacrifice and you do what it takes to, to get the job done. So I could, you know, certainly see that, you know, maybe I could do uh, a piece of fruit here and there. And if it didn't mess me up, then, then that might have a net positive to my performance. Mm-hmm. And so maybe I'll experiment with that going forward. I'm not sure. I don't want to, like I said, right now I want to be fair and be honest about what I'm doing and saying, what does an all-meat diet do to me? physiologically, performance-wise, and health-wise. And, uh, you know, so that's where, you know, I'm kind of at. I'm 14 months in. I'm, I'm still doing better. I'm You know, my performance continues to get better. I feel like I'm getting healthier. I'm, I like the way I feel. And, you know, if that changes, and certainly I'm not opposed to changing that, and I think we should all be open to that stuff. Well, I, I really appreciate you uh, doing all this, and I appreciate the way you talk about it. And I Oh, when you did your blood test, did you get your hormones tested also? That was another question I had. Uh, yes, I did some of them. I'll probably get some more, you know, Rob's got, uh, he's got a, he's in a, he's, he's, in a, he's involved with some group. that has got some, some advanced testing stuff that I'm going to probably add a few more tests in before I go there. But I did do some of that stuff. And I, I have, go- I have a, I have a hunch that, uh, you know, well, not a hunch. I mean, there's some evidence to suggest that eating more, especially saturated fats in your diet will increase testosterone. And we are in an epidemic of lower testosterone in men. It's been going down for for decades now, so yeah, I think that there, there's some evidence to say, that. and I've seen a number of guys. And I won't talk about my labs because, uh, but I've seen a number of guys that have done this that have shown, you know, an increase in their testosterone from doing this for a couple months. So mm-hmm. that that interesting. I think there's a lot of, you know, again, uh, I, I think we put a lot of faith in a single number, and I think there's some more variables that go into our hormone system that we have to be cognizant about. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk off the off the air. And Excellent. Okay. That's sweet. So. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Sure, yeah. man. I really yeah. appreciate it. It's been uh, fun. Go, go to YouTube. Check out Mind Pump TV. This is where we post videos, different content uh, than we do on the podcast, and they are free. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.